just a second, please. Okay, I would like to start with one question, nearly rhetoric question. What is older? First image of the brain or Scottish bagpipe? Any ideas? It's a serious question. Number one. Number one. <laughs> good, uh, good news, you both are right. Um, so this is an image um, from a book by a Belgian anatomist, Andreas Veselius, who um, yeah, presented for the first time a more or less detailed image of the brain. And um, uh, interestingly enough, before people uh, thought that ventricles to be the site of brain functions, and not, uh, not the cortex. And um, the first clear reference to the use of Scottish Highland, Highland bagpipes is from a French history. So it is nearly the same age, so congratulations. Good start. Um, I'm very excited to welcome you to the symposium Pet for Brain Connectivity, Back to the Future. Um, my name is Igor Yakoshev. I am a nuclear medicine physician from uh, Munich, Germany. And now I would like to uh, pass the word uh, to the person who mainly organized the symposium, Dr. Ariana Sala. Uh, she will tell us why we are here. Please, Ariana. <laughs> Okay, thanks for the <laughs> encouragement, <laughs> it's very nice. So why are we here? <laughs> so if you uh, go on PubMed and do a search for brain and connectivity keywords, so we look for brain connectivity studies, what we will get is a lot of results. And you see here the first things that come up is that there has been an exponential increase in brain connectivity studies. We have thousands of studies available. And the second thing that you see, if you look here in red, is that the majority of these studies, two thirds of them, uh, are done using functional MRI measures. So a lot of the evidence that we have available relies on one single measure, that is the hemodynamic signal that we derive from fMRI. Now, uh, the point, there is nothing wrong with that, but the point is that to study a complex system, we need more than one parameter to obtain a complete picture of how connectivity and networks subserve function and dysfunction in the brain. Um, so uh, based on this disproportion, uh, we decided to start an initiative. So this symposium is just really the first step in a bigger initiative, that's the Molecular Connectivity Working Group, and you can check us out on molecularconnectivity.com, that aims to really create a network of researchers interested in this topic and we plan, we plan really to create like say, a strategic joint effort in advancing this field in evaluating molecular imaging for the study of brain connectivity. Um, and of course, to do that, we need uh, resources, so we plan to apply for, uh, to, for fundings to, to, to get to do a cost action. Um, but anyway, so why do we think that this is so important? And I think it's quite instructive to actually go back to the history of connectivity. And here I'm talking about the human connectivity macro scale level. And I don't know if you know, uh, but actually uh, the first, let's say, functional connectivity studies, even if they were not called like that at the time, uh, started in uh, 70 years ago, and there were EEG studies in which uh, researchers assess cross correlations between signal uh, uh, from different electrodes. And then 30 years later in the 80s, so it's almost 40 years ago, we have the first interregional correlation studies based on PET. And it's only 10 years later that we have the first functional MRI functional connectivity study. And then other measures follow uh, based on structural connectivity, MEG, and uh, NIRS. And here, just to warm up the room a bit, I would like to ask you a few questions. So, 
uh, what, so uh, if you, uh, in the beginning of the 90s, Freeston uh, gave the first formal definition of functional connectivity. Do you know based on which data did he do it? Was this MRI data, EEG data, PET data? So let's try team MRI. <laughs> no? <laughs> EEG, <laughs> PET. Great, it's already, okay, but okay, maybe it's easy, it's the, the satellite of the brain and brain pet conference, so it's a bit biased, but yeah. So the first uh, definition of functional connectivity is based on water pet, perfusion pet data. And do you know, based on which data, again, the default mode network was first identified? Who says MRI? <laughs> okay, well, it's too easy, come on, okay, so yeah, again, it's pet. So it's based on a meta analysis of water uh, pet evidence. But okay, afterwards, actual fMRI, of course, uh, studies uh, increased, and the first description of resting state networks is based on functional MRI, and the first formal definition of the brain connectome is based on DVI DTI data. Um, so indeed, there has been like an uh, an increase in, FMR, in, in MRI based studies that of course has advantages. Uh, for example, it's cheaper, it's widely available now, there is no need to uh, irradiate the subject with ionizing uh, radiations compared to PET. But PET gives access to a series of molecular targets that are not uh, available uh, with uh, neurophysiological nor other neuroimaging techniques. And I will go to get to that in a second. So where, yeah, sorry, so important, PET, the arrows. So where are we now? Um, so there is a few reviews on connectivity based on the PET, but there is no systematic review. So what we did, with Silvia Caminiti and Aldana Lizarraga, who sacrificed for all of us and screened more than 5,000 abstracts. So we did a systematic review. We started, we searched for brain connectivity uh, network studies based on PET. We found more than 5,000 entries in PubMed and Scopus. And after the screening, we ended up with a database of more than 300 PET connectivity studies. So actually there is already quite a lot around and 51 different clinical conditions plus healthy controls have been assessed already and characterized from a molecular connectivity perspective. Um, so what are we looking uh, in, this, in this population? So this is molecular connectivity, but molecular connectivity means many, many things. We have many biological targets, and actually 18 different biological targets have been used uh, to investigate molecular networks. So just to give a bit of perspective, well, it's a bit small, sorry for that. Uh, this is what we can do with uh, other techniques. So with fMRI and fNIRS, we are at the level of the blood uh, vessels. So we are measuring a signal that is of course indirect compared to neural activity. With MEG and EEG, we go clo closer and we are at the postsynaptic level. And with PET, we can do really many things. So um, we have measures of perfusion and oxygen metabolism in the blood flow. And here the black arrow, the black uh, square indicates that there has been already a molecular connectivity study being performed. White, well, it is possible, but it has not been done yet. So you get an idea of where we are. So we can investigate again some markers that are um, related to the blood, so indirect. We have a lot of studies that are based on glucose metabolism that measure and that reflects metabolism takes taking place in astrocytes and neuron, which is coupled to glutamatergic synaptic activity, so excitatory activity for the most part. But we can go even closer to where the action is taking place at the postsynaptic uh, terminals, and we can characterize uh, different types of receptors for different neurotransmission system. And and this is something that only PET can do in humans in vivo. Okay, we can go at the presynaptic terminal and characterize different steps for different neurotransmission in the synthesis, in the transport, and in the release of neurotransmitters. And we can also investigate proteinopathies, so we can investigate pathological proteins that all also seem to propagate based on brain networks. So it, they also have been characterized in this sense. So this is what we have. But, the, but then what is missing? So we've started from the past, now we go back to the present, and then we will see about the future. So what is missing actually, so there is a lot of studies already, but we are missing a conceptual framework. 
So we, the questions here are, what is the meaning, what is the interpretation of molecular connectivity measures, and what is their relevance compared to other measures? And that's why we have three speakers for session one who will try to help us start addressing these questions. Second point is the validation. So we have really little studies about reproducibility of these measures and cross-validation with other measures, and that's why we have session two. And we, there are also new approaches. So um, um, we, I, I don't know if, if you know if you're not familiar with PET, but with PET we use usually static PET data, which means that we have only one image per subject is a, is, a, is a snapshot. And we model connectivity across subjects, across a subject series. We don't use time series usually. But there are new approaches that use instead what is called functional and dynamic PET that instead model connectivity more similar to what is done with fMRI uh, using time series. And these we will also uh, hear about today. Uh, and please don't run away after the, the end of the three sessions because at the very end of the symposium we will go actually back to the future with Igor <laughs> who will actually present the next steps um, of our initiative highlighting some important actions um, that we think should, we should, uh, we should um, start. Um, and we will also ask you if you would like actually to participate in these, uh, in these actions and he will explain how to do that. So, that's what I had to say. Igor, you want to come back <laughs> and give some final practical remarks? Thank you, Ariana. I just wanted to remind you of the um, format of the symposium. So, um, after each talk, there are five minutes for, for discussions, and there is a panel discussion after the third talk. Um, and we purposely created um, um, so much space to enable constructive discussion. Please use this opportunity, ask questions, answer questions. Um, and um, yeah, there are many debatable issues in the field, undoubtedly. And um, let's address them together. Okay, I think... Um, we have uh, all ingredients uh, for a successful meeting. We have a panel of excellent um, speakers and moderators. We have a panel of excellent sponsors and um, uh, endorsers. And we have a great audience, both in person and, and virtually. So um, let's start. Um, let's start with the first session. Yes. Okay. Is the microphone? Yes. Okay. So, okay, this is yours. <laughs> so, yeah, here we have uh, Silvia Caminiti, she's a postdoc at University, University Vita Santo San Raffaele in Milan. And Thank you. Should we introduce the speakers to start? You want to start? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's introduce uh, Professor Xin D, uh, assistant professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology, USA. His talk is about uh, glu glucose meta metabolism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and the introduction. Um, my name is Xin. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, glucose metabolic co covariance connectivity. Uh, as uh, Salah had already mentioned, uh, co connectivity, a, a central goal of uh, brain research is to study the, the, the interactions and connections between different brain regions. And as Friesen has been uh, 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 define this functional connectivity. The functional connectivity is basically some kind of statistical dependencies between some functional measures of the brain. Um, here we are talking about PET, and the most commonly used PET uh, agent is uh, FDG PET. FDG stands for fluorine dioxygen glucose, uh, which is a substrate that interacts with uh, glucose in the brain cells. So the assumption is that the neural activity will cause uh, energy consumption and then increase uh, the glucose uh, metabolic rate. Uh, so there are studies showing this kind of uh, support this view. 
And this is the very first study in 1981 that they show that the brain region activation, uh, glucose uh, metabolic rate actually increase shown here as a darker, uh, darker, uh, darker ima image uh, in the visual context as the uh, uh, visual stimulus complexity increases. And then there are uh, recent studies that compare different uh, task contrast uh, like, uh, of the activation of FDG PET and both fMRI. They show, uh, in most of the contrasts, they show very uh, good uh, agreement in different uh, brain regions, like lateral prefrontal cortex of, of mo most of the regions, but with the uh, exception of the default mode network. In the default mode network, uh, and some kind of task deactivation, uh, both can show some kind of task deactivation as, as revealed by black oxygen, but they were not shown in uh, metabolic activity. Uh, but uh, although there are some kind of dis disagreement, but I think we can fairly as assume that most of the uh, brain regions, there are uh, the, the glucose metabolic uh, rate as, as measured by FDG PET uh, can reflect some kind of a brain function indirectly. And this is kind of a um, assumption that we can, we, we can leverage then to study brain, uh, functional connectivity. And one of the challenges here is that uh, you, Mostly we, use, we have only one image uh, of the pack. We call static pack or we average the, the, all the dynamic pack together has one image for one subject. So the, the interaction of functional connectivity are actually calculated across different subjects. So that is the challenge. But uh, there are a few works, has had, uh, actually many works have been done to use leverage this uh, cross-subject correlations to study brain connectivity. And this is one of the two uh, pioneer works uh, published in 1984. Uh, here that they, uh, define uh, a few regions, in certain regions in the left and right hemisphere, and then calculate this uh, one of the, of the first functional connective connectome uh, of the brain. They show that certain regions, for example, in the frontal lobe, they will show very high correlations. And then there, in the same year, there are uh, Howitz and, and colleges, they use a, a, like a define a little bit more regions, and then show a more detailed uh, structures of brain, uh, of, of the correlation matrix structures. And then we can also use other methods. For this is from our group. So we can use data-driven methods such as ICA. So basically, we want to see regions that are very uh, similarly across subjects. And we can define components or independent components of, the, of this uh, region of, of, as a network. And of course, we can have different net, uh, networks. Basically, they are very relatively independently. And then we can compare this kind of networks with functional MRI networks that we ha have been already extensively studied. For example, we can see that there are networks like visual networks, um, uh, motor networks, deformed motor networks using fMRI. And we, we use a sim, uh, ICA on FDG PET. We can see some of the networks uh, th that are uh, pretty uh, uh, consistent. For example, there are visual cortex and a motor cortex. But it's very difficult to find networks like frontal parietal, uh, like lateral frontal parietal network or deformed motor network. So there are some discrepancies here. And later, we just uh, make it more in, in a whole brain, at a whole brain level, so we can study the whole brain, uh, we uh, whole brain functional connectivity using fMRI PET. And in this case, we also use the uh, gray matter volume as a, con uh, as a control conditions. And basically here, we compare these three um, measures of functional connectivity, and we see that the highest correlation is between the FDG PET and fMRI. And the correlation, although it is very significant, is the, the correlation value is only 0.3, but this one has the highest correlation compared with the uh, uh, gray matter volume co correlations. And also, using FDG PET, we can basically study the functional, structure, functional organization of the brain. In this case, the, all the re ROS uh, was divided into six or seven uh, functional modules, and we can see different, using different um, modalities of connectivity, FDG PET, or uh, GM, GMV, or fMRI, how can we separate those functional modules? And we, we see in this case, the FDG PET have the highest uh, modularity measures, which means that you can see there, uh, those regions can be separated by, by the con connectivity patterns of the FDG better than fMRI and uh, gray matter volumes. So those are basically uh, showing that, uh, showing that some validity of, of using FDG PET to study functional connectivity. But here, I tr I'm trying to break down some variants and to see uh, how to, how can we interpret this uh, uh, cross-subject correlations. Um, so I think it is very, I think it is very helpful to, to differentiate the, the, the variance here um, that give rise to the functional connect connectivity across subjects. Because here, the pro total problem is that uh, we have two brain regions, and we have one measure for one subject. Uh, we have many different measures from different, many different subjects. 
And what caused this variability, right? The first is something we, what we really like to have is a brain lag, uh, we call state lag uh, activity. Basically, it's from neural activity or some indirect measures of, of neural activity like, like glucose metabolic rates or CBF or both signals. And we think this is more important because it's more re functionally relevant, right? And what causes uh, th this variability is that for example, most of the uh, studies are using it called resting state. Resting state is kind of a, a right now it's got lots of criticism saying that it is we, we do not know the subject what the subject are doing, but that is good in in this sense. In my opinion, is that it introduced some kind of variabilities here because you do not know whether the subject really is thinking about something in the future or you know looking in, inside the scanner or so on. Those kind of variability can introduce some kind of neural variability. So if if that's the case, then it can give rise to a higher correlations. And of course, there are some other kind of a uh, trait-like uh, uh, component here. Basically, it's the individual differences. Uh, it, is, it, can may, uh, re it may reflect some kind of genetic influences or experience or any kind of influences. But here, the question is that whether this trait-like individual differences have similar structures. If you, if you calculate correlation of this part, whether they, be, they will show similar kind of functional organization or not. If they are not, then we have to if we can, uh, the best thing is that if we can differentiate these this two types of variabilities, but it is very difficult, maybe. So I, um, here I would like to discuss a little bit about this. So I think that if we can compare different modalities data, maybe we can get more insight of this effect. For example, for fMRI, we, we have calculated this neural, neural ac activity and correlations in inherently a within subject manner, so that we have removed this trait like individual differences part, right? And we also have brain structure uh, measurement. So we can use brain structure to see correlation, uh, the, the correlation matrices and to see what kind of structure do they have. And if we compare them directly, then we can have a better sense of what of these two uh, components looks like. And of course, um, most of studies we have uh, with a cross-subject design because uh, it's very difficult. It, it, we, we can only, only have a static uh, measurement um, and we, ha we have to leverage a large sample size. But if we have a within subject design, um, it, it could have a better understanding of these two effects. So what we have done here is that we analyzed the data from Alzheimer disease neuro uh, neuroimaging initiative, uh, also ADNI. So we we mainly pick subjects that have more than, first of all, all the subjects are healthy subjects here we analyzed. We mainly pick subjects that have at least five, com uh, five runs of data. So we have a fairly good uh, <coughs> subject design. And we have FDG PET and uh, uh, fMRI, we can use uh, anatomical image, uh, we can use VBM uh, techniques to measure the gray matter volume in the data. And al also in the subset of subjects, we have functional MRI data. So we have three modalities here. And so those, in the bottom we have this uh, scan, uh, the age distributions of all the imaging data. So each line represents one subject, each row represents one subject. We have five to uh, nine runs for pet, uh, FDG PET data. So in this case, what we can do is that we can calculate the correlation in two different ways, right? We within subjects, we, although we have only five or nine uh, runs, we can calculate the correlation matrices. And although it's very, uh, very uh, noisy, but we have that many, sub that many subjects, we can average them to increase to the signal to noise ratio. And also, uh, we can also calculate in a cross subject way. In this case, a good thing is that we can uh, somehow uh, contribute a little bit about these uh, individual differences because here we can control for the age. There's no age effect, which it, it could be a huge confounding variable if we have a large age range. So, and then we have this uh, uh, brain parcellations. We use uh, Schaefer's 100, 100 ROS of, of the cortex and, and uh, 14 ROS from the subcortical regions. And those regions are what divided into seven networks from left and right hemisphere and subcortical regions. And you can see some kind of structure like this if the if the measure can, uh, can reflect the functional mode or organizations of the brain. So first, we the question we want to ask is that whether the cross-subject and uh, uh, within-subject correlation are, are similar, can have similar structures. So here, uh, first is a brain structural coherence calculated from uh, gray matter volume images. We see there is a little uh, structures uh, uh, along the diagonal and also between left and right co uh, corresponding regions. And also, it's very interesting to see that cross-subject and within-subject we can have very similar uh, kind of a correlation, but the correlation is uh, about 0.5 something. It's a very, uh, very impressive high. And then we have glucose metabolic correlations. And in this case, we see that we have even stronger correlation and also structures of the brain, uh, of the brain organizations. And also we have a very high agreement between 
cross subject and within subject correlation. And the correlation is, is really high, it's uh, about 0.77. And then we have this functional MRI as a uh, kind of a reference. It's not the golden standard, but we can have it as, as a reference. And we can see that the structural coherence, whether it's, it's calculated from within subject or cross subject, it has some kind of a moderate correlation, 0 0.4 and 0 0.3. It is okay. And then, but if we have PET, and I, I, you can see that we have a much higher correlation of about 0.7. And, uh, uh, and in both cases, the within subject uh, correlation is, is higher than compared with cross subject correlation. So it's just a little bit um, of discussion here. So we see that we, we compare the cross subject and within subject correlations, and we, see, we do see that there are actually very high agreement uh, with, with each other. And in, in both cases, the within subject is a little bit higher and co correlated with, uh, uh, with, with functional MRI measurements. And also, we in, in this case, we put the coherence, uh, the structural coherence as a control condition. It, it, it shows the correlation, but uh, SDG PET actually shows much higher correlations with the uh, with, with resistance connectivity compared with, uh, FD, uh, with FDG correlation. So uh, kind of uh, support the, the usage of FDG as a measure of functional connectivity. And here, I really show that the correlation is, is re really impressive. It's greater than 0.7, which means that the, the variance shared is about 50%. And you can uh, you remember that our previous study, we showed only a correlation of 0.3. I think the two, maybe two regions can explain this. First is that, we use a better uh, brain parcellations. We use, in this case, we use Schaeffer, Schaeffer which I, I think uh, is, uh, has been validated using functional MRI data. And another reason is that we really, we have, uh, we have calculated the, the correlation matrix and then we, ca ca we, we uh, average cross subjects or cross age point. So that the averaging effect can I I increase the, the, I increase the, uh, the signal to noise ratio. It means that two things, first, first is that it measures something uh, similar uh, sim uh, of the similar uh, underlying structure, so that by averaging, it can increase correlations, right? It is a good thing. But uh, on the other hand, it means that in the current state, uh, using the current uh, uh, technology, if we, we do not have an averaging effect, the signal to noise ratio be maybe quite limited, so that the correlation could not be very high if, if without averaging uh, across la large sample size. Last, just a, a few uh, considerations of, of, of methods. First is that we have a lot of studies trying to validate and we use measurement of correlations, but usually the correlation, uh, we, we can think about this as a, a, a effect size measurement. And we know that for example, if you only have a 0.3 correlations, the shared variance is only 10%, uh, so it's very limited. So the, the, you know, the effect size really matters that how, how well you can uh, reflect these two uh, matrices. And second thing is that when we design a study, really we want to uh, minimize the individual differences. If we, we have a small sample size, maybe we can reduce the age range. And if we have a large sample size, maybe we have to you know, model the age range to remove the age, age effect. Maybe we can increase the, uh, the, the, uh, the measurement. And, and of, of course, uh, minimize individual differences. The, the, the best way to do it is that we can have a multiple measures for, for, for within subjects. Uh, it may be very difficult, and, and I think uh, later we, we will discuss uh, of the dynamic path, maybe it will be helpful, but at the current age stage, I think the problem is that the signal-to-noise ratio is still very, very uh, limited. And because of the signal-to-noise ratio is very limited in the, in the current stage, I think uh, maybe a, a good large sample size is needed to get a very reliable measurement. And the last, is the last point is that uh, we most of study right now is about is using resting state. I think it is good that we can ensure some kind of variability of the neural activity, so that um, we can have a high good good uh, good correlations. Uh, we can think about other tasks. For example, it's a very high, high demanding task. The good thing is that the subjects may have very high activation, but they may the ac the activity may be attenuated in in certain regions, so that. Uh, if, uh, if, if there is no variability, when we calculate the correlation, then we, we cannot get anything. So that is my opinion on this matter. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all the lab members and, and for, for more lab members and collaborators from Dr. Pickler's lab, especially uh, Hans Wall. And also thanks for Adney for the open sharing data and funding. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Uh, I think for the first time in history, we are actually ahead of time, so we have a bit more time for questions, so, which was very effective. <laughs> okay, so are there already some questions? Oh, Joanna, 
please. Yet many. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Uh, thanks very much for this uh, exciting talk. I actually have two questions. I'm not sure the first one, I, I got you correctly, I understood you correctly, but you seem to show some um, uh, surfaces of uh, brain images uh, with uh, PET correlations, and within uh, those PET correlations, there were positive ones and negative ones. Am I correct? Right, right. How do you interpret those negative correlations? It's very, very difficult because in PET, you have to do some kind of global normalization. That part can introduce negative correlation. And of course, there are some kind of, naturally, they will some kind of negative correlation. But for PET, you know, for fMRI, usually we just referring to do the global co uh, normalization, then the, it's more interpretable. Yeah. Uh, in this case, I think it's difficult. You, you, you don't know whether it's really uh, introduced by the, some kind of uh, pre-processing step or they are real negative correlations. I feel that okay. cannot be so. Do you think it's possible the interpretation uh, could somewhat be similar to the one that we give to the negative or anti-correlations in fMRI, or you think it would be something different? You, you know, the, the paper I cite the, in the PNS paper, uh, they show that there's no, uh, the default mode network at least, there's kind of, a, uh, in, in PET you can see some deactivation, but you, you think FDG PET, you cannot. So in that part, I, I, I I, I don't know, so. You don't know at the moment. Mm. Oh, but thanks for the honesty, because, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, and I have another question. Um, I had to write it down, sorry for that. So um, the, you showed that the FDG covariance was more similar to the one observed in breast instead of MRI right. than, for example, gray matter covariance. Right. And uh, I know from previous literature that actually the covariance present in fMRI is similar to the one in gray matter. So gray matter covariance usually overlaps about 40% with true connectivity, which is the one that we actually derive from white matter tracts linking right. uh, great matter regions. But there are several studies that um, are trying to suggest the remaining 60% of connectivity we see in gray matter covariance networks actually correspond to functional connections. Right. So what do you think about that? So I think it, there are different measures. Here we only report the correlations. This is uh, basically the whole, all, all of everything, and we correlated the correlation coefficient, basically the uh, connectivity strength, mm -hmm. and we have, have a correlation of about like 0.7 or 0.4. And uh, what you, I think, what you suggest is that you normalize, I mean, binarize by using a way, and then you can see how, how, how much of the connections are overlapping in that, in that sense. Um, so I, I think, um, Stru structural coherence is more, uh, actually, I, I don't, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to say. Um, right, right. Please don't criticize uh, mm. gray matter covariance because I'm very much uh, 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 for it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but no, I, I, I'm not uh, criticizing it. But, but, but basically, we want to show here that you, you have different me measures and then you have uh, different levels of associations. And gray matter volume, at, at least in our data, we show that have the least correlation. Of course, if, if you uh, cal calculate the overlap, overlaps, you can see some overlaps, definitely we would have. Um, right, uh, but I just, what, what I just want to show, okay, this is a, the correlation. there are individual differences there, and then we, we, if we want to address pad correlations, we want to take that as a baseline. The uh, gray matter volume covariance, there are something there. Definitely. Will you look at it in the future, the overlap of the connections right, between right. gray matter covariance right. and FDG? Mm. Uh, we, we, we have uh, a look at the diffusion. The diffusion actually have a, slow, a slightly lower correlation with all the measures. It's not mm -hmm. as good as functional MRI. I, uh, yeah, the data uh, we have showing that. But we, uh, we did not report it here, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Great you. talk. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Um, I actually, if I can stop you, <laughs> ah, <no laughs> because I have actually a question about uh, all the negative correlations. <laughs> Unless you also have a question on that. Oh, then you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, hello. Um, I was wondering how you do the uh, whole brain normalizations for the human brain scans so that you get these negative correlations. I believe it, it, you have a co-brain mean and divide it, right? Yes, but do, do you do them on the whole so the whole brain uptake of the FGG, right, right, right. the whole brain, whole brain, the integrated mask, the whole brain mask, uh, mask. For and then the average of all the subjects in your group, or no, no, no. This has been done for each subject. That is the problem you mm -hmm. have. 
diff different subjects have a different global vi values. Okay. Uh, right. that, that, that's why you have a negative correlation. Hey, uh, everyone wants to ask questions, right? I have a question to <laughs> Joanna. Uh, because, uh, where are you? Yes, yes, because, um, well, you, you're uh, interested in gray matter covariance. What do you think it's um, um, a representation of functional properties of the brain or structural? The gray matter covariance. Yes. First, Since you work with gray matter covariance, right? I understood. Can I this microphone, please? Otherwise, these ones. So here. it's more a functional. Yeah. Otherwise, in the people following in streaming, can you cannot hear you? Just go there, and we cannot move it because it's the camera. <laughs> so sorry. Not really. <laughs> it's not on. Not from. Not from the Try now. Try now. Try now. But okay. you can use this mic. I will tell you that this part here. Yeah, it's anarchy uh, already. Thank you very much. I just wanted also to mention that Aldana will also present our own data later, and we also found, um, as, as seen, um, um, larger overlap between FDG PET and fMRI, and lower between FDG PET and gray matter covariance. Yes, Chris. Yeah, uh, I really enjoyed. I have one thing. Do you think maybe that the uh, the trade variance and the admin data is somewhat compressed? And if you allowed, for instance, lifespan data or, or more trade variability, then you might see more disjunctures in your computations. Right. right um, I think uh, the quality of the admin data is not as good. So I think there will be more. If we have other data sets, we have other uh, you know various maybe we c maybe have better results. That's what I feel. So f the, the uh, for the other data, the functional MRI, the TR is three, and then there, there are only one, a little bit more than one hundred ten points. So and I mean the quality may not be that good. But um, it, I was really surprised that we can get a correlation of very high that high. Um, Y yes, we, we currently, the, the, if we have current neural image te techniques, I think the correlation could be higher. Yeah, yeah, you know, I found it surprising too. You, so it might even be higher if one has a more homogeneous data set. Right, right, right. Thank you. Yeah, th also, the, it is a multi site, and then we ha also have set effects. So we have. Oh, Thank you. Okay, um, I have a short question again on the negative correlation, sorry. So I'm just wondering really, so you did global mean scaling. Right, right, right. So how much that affect your data? Because for example, with fMRI, I'm not an expert, but I know that when you do right. global signal regression, right. so right. you just put all your data, or I mean, you right. the mean right. is the but same, you yeah. get similar distribution of correlations. Right. So right. how much it is like this, and how much it is dependent on the choice? That's you, you something you have to do because of the global signal is very varies yeah. a lot. Uh, for fMRI, we, we will avoid this. But we can remove the signals from wet matter at CSF. I don't know whether we can do it a similar at PET, but we, we do not. We just use global. Uh, we know that that will affect the result, but uh, I don't know what kind of uh, obvious solution for that. I also have a question oh. for you. Okay, um, oh, two questions. Right. If I'm <laughs> maybe three. Okay, the first question is uh, uh, the reason why there is more modularity in fMRI data. Uh, you find maybe right. okay. I will. Um, 
I, that, that one, I, I think it is may... It, mm. Is it maybe related to much more inter-individual variability, this high modularity? Um, I, I really don't know what, how to it interpret. I think one of the things that we <laughs> the global signal regression maybe affect that part, um, right? And others, I honest, I, I do not have an interpretation of those. Okay, the other question is already, um, okay, sorry. Uh, again, about the uh, inter-individual variability. How do you think that we can manage this in the, to check at the beginning of our experiment this inter-individual variability? This may be particularly difficult when you are studying, for example, cohort of patients with neurodegenerative diseases right. because they have different pattern of uh, hypometabolism expression right, that right, may... Right. Okay. If you try to make them more homogeneous, you can lose yeah, some yeah. part, important part about the pathology. Right, right, right. So of course, of course. I'm particularly I interested. Mean, for, for patients, I <laughs> yeah. kind of, I don't know how any idea. Maybe just that when you have control, have larger sample size for that. <laughs> I, I don't have any think. Okay, we should work that. about it. It's very difficult. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank okay, you. there is a question from YouTube, but uh, we are running out of time, so uh, Cyril, we will get back to you in the general discussion. So I think we can call the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, I will try to say it right. <laughs> so Eric Gedge, more or less, from <laughs> the University of Marseille, uh, Hosp University Hospital of Marseille in France. So we talk again about interpretation of connectivity measures and now focusing on neurotransmission. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ariana, for the kind introduction. Uh, I have to select the uh, good talk. Yes, so thank you for the kind introduction and uh, to you, Ariana, and to uh, Igor for the, uh, the invitation and the uh, organization of this uh, exciting uh, symposium. I'm uh, very pleased to be with you to talk about um, neurotransmission connectivity, neurotransmission related uh, connectivity, with this uh, possible paradigm shift from the metabolic uh, connectivity, which is yet an uh, emerging concept, especially for clinical uh, applications, towards uh, perhaps more specific targets, more uh, molecular uh, targets for no transmission connectivity using PET, using static PET at this step, using a static uh, SPECT also, with a special attention uh, given for this talk to the dopaminergic pathways and to uh, Parkinsonism. As, um, yes. As uh, already mentioned by uh, our colleague, I also propose you to uh, start uh, from the metabolic PET connectivity. This uh, modeling aims to uh, detect functional interaction between uh, brain uh, regions using FDG PET, and metabolic connectivity can be obtained uh, with uh, various uh, methods, uh, with seed correlation, with uh, sparse inverse covariance estimation, uh, also with principal or independent component analysis, or uh, even graph uh, theory. And it was said in comparison to functional MRI, and despite uh, lower temporal dimension, metabolic PET uh, provides a better signal to nose ratio, and also uh, better uh, variance uh, concentration uh, since approximately 50% of the cumulative variance is captured by the two first uh, principal components with PET data, while the first 14 components are requested uh, using a functional MRI. And the cerebral metabolic rate of uh, glucose is also certainly a better uh, defined, at least a better understood uh, signal in physiological and in pathological context, while the, the bold signal uh, results for more composite effects, the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, the cerebral blood flow, the cerebral blood volume uh, changes, 
uh, in response to uh, excitatory uh, neurotransmission. And you see the, the degree of uh, spatial similarity between uh, functional MRI and uh, uh, metabolic uh, PET using FDG for the 10 main brain networks uh, obtained at uh, resting states. I um, propose you to, uh, to give you uh, at least one uh, example of uh, application of uh, metabolic PET uh, connectivity here in uh, clinical neuroscience with this uh, European multicentric study on the impact on, of uh, cognitive reserve on prodromal AD, on prodromal Alzheimer disease. Patients with uh, higher education level had higher metabolism of the right uh, dorsolateral frontal cortex and using a seed correlation, the analysis showed a larger uh, recruitment of metabolic networks from this frontal region in high education uh, level in comparison to low uh, education level, both in patients and in LC subjects, providing uh, arguments for functional compensation. Nevertheless, we know that the cerebral metabolic rate of glucose is also closely linked to the uh, synaptic changes, to integrated synaptic changes, and thus globally to uh, neurotransmission. In this line, uh, we can consider that metabolic connectivity may also reflect uh, non-specific neurotransmission uh, and non-specific neurotransmission connectivity. And changes in cortical and in subcortical metabolism are well known in typical and atypical uh, Parkinsonism and, you know, included in the current clinical recommendation. We should uh, thus first consider uh, to approach the uh, neurotransmission-related connectivity by using metabolic uh, connectivity. And we have to highlight the important works made for years by the group of Professor uh, Edelberg in Parkinson's disease, also in atypical Parkinsonism. They have developed a scaled subprofile uh, model to define a Parkinson disease related pattern. This profile has been uh, validated at a multicentric uh, level, correlated to uh, clinical impairment. And importantly for the, the, the present talk, correlated to the dopaminergic uh, uh, denervation, to dopaminergic changes in Parkinson's disease, um, linking uh, those, the metabolic connectivity to the neurotransmission. And you see this um, um, pattern has been proposed as a biomarker, especially for clinical trials and in the early stage of the uh, disease. In this way, uh, partial correlation uh, analysis was used in this uh, very interesting uh, study to uh, determine the impairment of uh, neurotransmission uh, system. It is FDG PET exam. And here in the alpha synuclein uh, spectrum, uh, namely in patients with uh, Parkinson's disease, in patients with uh, Lewy uh, de body dementia, and patients with idiopathic rapid eye movement uh, sleep behavior disorder. And using metabolic uh, PET connectivity for the nigro striatocortical uh, dopaminergic networks, for the noradrenergic network, and the cholinergic networks. In fact, uh, you understand, without specificity of the biological target for uh, neurotransmission, again, it is FDG PET examination. Uh, interpretation of findings are based on uh, our anatomical knowledge of these uh, systems. And besides uh, Parkinsonism, the same metabolic uh, approach has been proposed to uh, study uh, the dopamine pathways in Alzheimer's uh, disease within the mesocorticolimbic system, again with FDG PET uh, imaging. I would like to uh, briefly uh, mention two studies of our group on this topic of the metabolic connectivity in movement disorders. The first study, uh, it's a study in patients with essential tremor before and after uh, radiosurgery. 
It's a radiosurgery of the thalamus, uh, precisely the, the, the ventral intermediate nucleus. And we showed uh, changes in connectivity between the target, the thalamus, and temporo-occipital regions explaining altered response to uh, treatment. And the second study, uh, uh, this study combined interregional correlation and graph theory analysis in uh, impulse control, control disorders associated to Parkinson's disease. And we showed changes in uh, metabolic connectivity within the mesocorticolimbic system explaining the specific behavior. I propose you uh, now to make this uh, conceptual transition uh, from the metabolic connectivity to a more specific, uh, to more specific targets for neurotransmission or lactide connectivity. And for example, uh, using uh, SPECT imaging of the dopamine transporter activity. We know, of course, the clinical interest, the, the sensitivity of this uh, biomarker, even at the early stage of the uh, disease, of the Parkinson disease. We have first to mention that Warburg voxel based analysis can be applied to uh, that imaging and to that uh, spect to explore the activity of striatal, but also extra uh, striatal regions. Here in LC subjects with a statistical association to age, a negative correlation to age, and the statistical association uh, with gender, with higher uptake in uh, women in comparison to, uh, to men. And this uh, extra striatal uptake could be uh, relevant and could be a complementary biomarker to distinguish between typical and atypical Parkinsonism. Um, well, I, I think I will not have time to develop the, the, the methodological aspect of the no transmission connectivity and this uh, paradigm shift uh, from uh, unspecific uh, metabolic connectivity to those related to a specific target. But you can refer to this uh, uh, very detailed uh, article on covariance statistic and network uh, analysis uh, using brain PET uh, imaging, using FDG, but also uh, using dopamine and serotonin targets. This uh, work uh, demonstrates the feasibility uh, of the neurotransmission approach for uh, connectivity. And uh, we uh, consequently uh, use uh, the, the same uh, approach. Here it is an uh, interregional correlation analysis to study the dopaminergic pathways in LC uh, subjects within uh, nigrostriatal, mesolimbic, and mesocortical networks using uh, that spect, static that uh, spect and fluorodopa uh, imaging, again, static PET uh, imaging, in comparison to uh, metabolic uh, connectivity of FDG uh, PET. And we uh, demonstrated uh, stronger results, uh, better sensitivity, uh, better specificity uh, of the fluorodopa targets of fluorodopa imaging, uh, especially uh, for the mesocortical uh, projection in comparison uh, to FDG, you see here the projection on the uh, frontal region using uh, this uh, correlation with uh, the fluorodopa uh, target. And using uh, that spect on the previous uh, mentioned topic of uh, impulse uh, control disorders in uh, Parkinson's disease, this study suggests that the pathological behavior uh, may correspond to a frontal uh, striatal disconnection with, in fact, less correlation in patients with impulse control uh, disorder. And here, another study on another motor behavior in Parkinson's disease, the freezing of gait, which was associated to uh, mesolimbic and mesocortical changes using uh, neurotransmission connectivity, uh, again uh, using fluorodopa uh, imaging. And uh, finally, I mentioned this uh, voxel-based uh, study on uh, serotonin uh, PET uh, connectivity 
in a connectivity, in pet connectivity, in anxiety uh, disorders. And interestingly, the, the biomarker is, uh, is, is used uh, with uh, specific changes before and after uh, uh, treatment. I would like also to uh, mention, to highlight some perspective, they will be uh, developed uh, on other talk uh, afterwards, but some perspective for the, this no transmission related connectivity. Of course, new relevant targets for uh, no transmission system, especially uh, using uh, uh, instrumentation quality of PET uh, imaging. We have also to mention uh, technological advances in uh, uh, instrumentation, of course, the uh, uh, availability of PET uh, MRI uh, device to combine uh, metabolic PET connectivity, molecular PET connectivity uh, with uh, functional connectivity and even structural uh, connectivity with tractography in uh, MRI. We can also mention the introduction of new uh, uh, technology of detection with a very high performance uh, in terms of sensitivity and time of flight, um, especially to develop further uh, temporal uh, dynamic acquisition for functional imaging. Uh, using, for example, it will be uh, presented, uh, for example, using constant infusion of uh, uh, FDG. Um, finally, uh, if I, ha I have a few, few minutes left, I would like to mention this uh, next uh, data challenge organized by uh, our French uh, National Society of uh, Nuclear Medicine in partnership with this uh, government agency called Health Data Hub. It's a French uh, uh, agency, uh, specifically on dopamine spect uh, imaging. You know, of course, the, 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 the topic and the issue of uh, that spect uh, imaging for uh, Parkinsonism and approximately 20% uh, of uh, exam with uncertain uh, classification, especially in a non-expert interpretation in practice. We hope to uh, propose to offer this uh, data challenge next year. Uh, we hope based on 5,000 examination, it will be a French uh, acquisition, in combination with uh, clinical data and expert interpretation. We uh, anticipate a price of 25,000 euros for the winner. The winner will be the, the candidate uh, will propose the algorithm that will come closest to the expert interpretation. And in the medium term, we would like to uh, exploit this uh, database in connection with the data from uh, health system, from the French health system, to address more specific uh, question, more scientific uh, question around no protection, the impact of uh, therapeutics, for example, also on uh, some uh, emerging uh, disease, and. Uh, probably also by using this uh, no transmission uh, connectivity uh, approach. To uh, conclude, uh, I would say that no transmission connectivity can be in fact be addressed by a metabolic uh, connectivity. We have the link with the first uh, talk of our colleague. In absence of uh, real uh, uh, genuine specificity of FDG, or using more specific targets, for example, targets of the dopaminergic system. Potential is uh, important with a very interesting perspective, uh, combining advances in uh, radiopharmaceutical, instrumentation, acquisition, post-processing, and further clinical application. Thank you, thank you for attention. Okay, thank you very much. Are there already any questions? Yes, Mattia, <laughs> run to the microphone. <laughs> yes. Or less? Okay. Thanks a lot for the, the overview of this dopaminergic neurotransmission connectivity, Eric. I have a question that's uh, been in my mind uh, for many years now, 
since the paper. So, uh, and I haven't been able to get a, an answer. So maybe you get my, uh, you get an answer for me. What's good definitions of neurotransmission connectivity? Uh, because you know, I can I can understand or can give an answer for metabolic connectivity. So two areas that you know they have the same energy demand, so they might be doing you know, certain things together. But the neurotransmission connectivity, you know, molecular connectivity, in the way that you know when we work neurotransmissions, I, I have a very and uh, a kind of like gray definition at the moment. And following up based on whatever definition, do you think that when we do molecular connectivity at this level with neuroreceptor, we should integrate, you know, the knowledge, or, or the physical knowledge of the pathways or of the neurons projecting from one area to the brains on the covariance uh, analysis? It's a conceptual uh, question and, of course, a tricky issue, and I'm sure uh, to have the, the, the correct response. But, of course, I think we cannot apply the same conceptual definition uh, uh, for uh, neurotransmission connectivity. I prefer the, the formulation of uh, uh, neurotransmission related connectivity um, in comparison to a more structural connectivity. But uh, in fact, if we uh, consider the um, neurotransmission as the chemical uh, release uh, uh, connecting uh, to uh, neurons, it's, it's a connection, it's uh, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a kind of uh, of connectivity. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's a way to explore the the, the, the connectivity with specific uh, targets. And I think it is a relevant approach for some models, some models uh, with, of course, uh, uh, the improvement of uh, neurochemical uh, pathway, especially for the Parkinson disease. But I agree uh, with you, and uh, I'm not sure to propose the, the consensual definition for neurotransmission-related uh, collectivity. But of course, the, the connectivity is also uh, supported by the neurotransmission. Thanks. <laughs> Other questions? Otherwise, I have one actually related to the... Um, the, the, the point of Mattia, like we should, should we investigate specific pathways when we do this kind of analysis? So the question is, so differently from, um, let's say, standard connectivity based on FTG PET or fMRI or whatever, so we have a general marker <coughs> of activity. Here we can go really in, into something specific, but then how do you select, let's say, where do you run the analysis in the first place in the brain, where it makes sense to look at, because I mean, dopaminergic um, receptors, they are end transporters, they are high in some part in the brain, less high in other parts and almost uh, absent in others. So where do you set the threshold and say, it makes sense to look at this here <laughs> or not? Well, I'm not sure to have again the, the response, but I think the, the, the best response, it, it depends on the model, on the clinical model. If uh, we uh, have interest on uh, uh, disease with uh, uh, altered uh, neurotransmission, and again, uh, for example, uh, the, the Parkinson disease or some psychiatric uh, disease uh, for which the, the metabolism is uh, probably uh, less impaired, less uh, impaired in comparison, for example, to neurodegenerative disease, Perhaps we, we, we could expect a better contrast with a neurotransmission uh, approach. And if we want to consider a connectivity a characterization, I will uh, use uh, neurotransmission connectivity for this uh, model. I think it, it depends on the, on, the di on the disease. We have to consider uh, a, a, a disease associated to an impairment of a network. Possibly uh, not all diseases uh, are related to an impairment of uh, network. Epilepsy is, uh, of course, the, the model of uh, uh, an impairment of, of network. But if, if you want to uh, consider the, the, the neurochemical uh, characteristic, the neurotransmission, I think uh, we should uh, consider a disease with a uh, uh, well-known uh, characterized uh, and, and well-known uh, uh, alteration of uh, neurotransmission circuits, for example, the, the, 
the movement disorders or psychiatric disease. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to move on, but we will have more time thank to you. discuss later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's introduce Professor Richard Carson from uh, Yale University in USA. His talk is about uh, synaptic density. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. I'd like to thank Ariana and Igor for the kind invitation and for us to talk about uh, another dimension of what we can add in looking at, at connectivity with PET here using synaptic density as measured by our SV2A marker. So what I'd like to do is this is going to bounce around a bit. And I apologize in advance because for some of you this will be a new marker. I'd like to give you a little introduction of like, the conventional methods we can do. But then also look at that as one additional very interesting marker that we can relate to, to other topics that we're, other things that we're looking at, how we relate that with FDG, for example, and Alzheimer's disease, how we relate that with a neurotransmission marker, looking at a glutamate marker, and, and then it began looking at particular independent component analysis strategies with fMRI as well as in disease. So adding static but also multivariate in different ways. Um, the target we're looking at is a synaptic vesicle protein, so in the presynaptic terminals. This is called SV2A. It was originally discovered as part of treatment for epilepsy. It's the target of levetiracetam, the anticonvulsant. And we have been able to develop a nice tracer. There's a collaboration with UCB. There's a number of these out there in the world with extremely high uptake and very high quality images there. So you're seeing examples of the uptake. Not surprisingly, you're seeing high uptake in, in the gray matter and very low uptake in the, in the white matter. And we were able to do then modeling analysis so that when we do a scan, we're not just getting a static, we're getting two values. We're going to get our volume of distribution, VT. It's our baseline measure of the, effectively, the SV2A protein concentration, a, a, a measure of synaptic density. We're also getting a, a functional measure, K1, the delivery. And those values are such that we are going to be sensitive to blood flow, as I'll show you in a little bit. And we're able to show the target that we can displace this specifically in human beings. So we know we're looking at this particular molecular target. We had done validations. Others are going on being able to look at that to compare that to conventional Western blots or other measures in the baboon brain and found very good correlation. So we know we're measuring this target, which has a very good correlation with synaptophysin. That's a traditional measure of synaptic density. And more work needs to be done to continue that validation. Let me give you a brief non-exciting standard clinical result. We've done this study in AD. Others have been doing that. They show the regional pattern differences that you'd be able to see there, and particularly in early, the, the primary error we saw was in hippocampus. But it, as we got our cohorts a little bit further along, we're starting to see large changes across the brain. And recognizing, of course, we're dealing with atrophy, we have to do some partial volume correction. We still see the nice clear differences in entorhinal cortex, hippocampus, BRAC1 and 2 stages, but now seeing it across all cortical stages. Let's do that one. Good. What gets interesting is when we can start correlating these measures. This is a, a kind of a global synaptic measure there against the cognitive measures, looking just in the patient populations. And where we're seeing very strong correlations there, suggesting that now we're seeing something, whether we're seeing that more on the, instead of the individual state at that moment, the trait of those patients in the progression of the disease. Interesting topics there. So, First thing that says, okay, we have a new tool that we can add, and it's something that we can complement the, the tools we've talked about with FDG and neurotransmission as well as with fMRI. We could also correlate that within the disease. A very obvious question would be when you losing synapses, are you gaining tau or vice versa, is tau introducing that? And so we we're able to do that. Obviously, in Alzheimer's, there's very nice measurements of tau, in this case with fortalsapir. We're seeing a smaller differences that we see in synaptic destiny numerically, but we're getting these very interesting correlations in a network manner. Here we're looking at an entorhinal cortex, the uptake of fortalsapir as a measure of tau. It projects in the peripheral path to the hippocampus, and we have this lovely negative correlation. More tau in entorhinal cortex, less SV2A synaptic density that you see. And here, we, this is a small study, so we're concluding our controls as well as our patients. And interestingly, the two, these two points are amyloid positive, cognitively normals, which seem to fall in between. So again, bringing two different measures together here in a very specific network, entorhinal cortex up to hippocampus in a disease where that's relevant. So one question is this measure that we have, we're measuring these proteins, this glycoprotein sitting on these synapses. Is this a state measure? Is this something of that going on that moment? If we're functionally activated, is this going to be changing our signal or is in fact just more of a static? Are we doing an in vivo Western blot right now for this protein. So we did a very kind of classical study. We did a 
a visual activation study, uh, reminiscent of one that was done with flumazenil about 30 years ago. So we did pairs of scans where in one case they were looking at just a focal point, the other one doing 8 hertz classic checkerboard. And we did the same tool looking at that in fMRI just kind of as a, as a validation. And here's the result visually. Remember, we talked about we had two measures. We had that binding measure, that VT, and we also get that flow measure. Here's an example of what the flow images look like, the K1 image. We get, of course, the spectacular activation of the visual cortex, very, very old ideas, about that 30% increase in across all our subjects. If we look at the binding measure, we're not seeing a change here in the primary visual cortex and a few other control regions there. So that suggests with one scan, we can get to, for the price of one, we're going to get a functional measure, the state at that time, from the K1 in an analogous fashion, perhaps to what we might be getting with, with FDG or perhaps with fMRI, as well as this state trait measure that we're seeing in terms of synaptic density. So we'll keep that one in mind. And in fact, uh, I hate to say that we were using PET to validate MRI, it went the other way around, but you know, that 30% change that we can see in K1 correlated within subject with the bold signal change. So we're, it gives us one way of tying these data sets together. And what's interesting, when we fitted our first study in Alzheimer's disease, we looked at the same thing. We looked at, in our volume and distribution measure, this was a small cohort. We didn't have as much statistical power. We saw the primary results here in medial temporal lobe and in the hippocampus. But when we looked at the flow-based measure, K1, we saw the hippocampus, but we also saw the classical re areas, temporal parietal regions, precuneus, that we see in FDG. So again, suggesting that we're going to see this functional measure at the same time getting that more static trait measure. So let's look at that a little bit more. So we're here what we're doing in our AD cohort, looking at measures of flow, measures of um, synaptic density with PET against FDG in those same subjects, and how can we compare and look at those together? So we did a canonical correlation analysis there just to be able to see how well these pair if I get based on regional data, and here we're doing this with atrophy correction, so we're not adding that in as a variable, being able to do pairs of things. And we can do, we have three variables here, because I have our synaptic measure, that's a, in this case a distribution volume ratio against FDG, but we can also look at that against the flow measures or how flow works against glucose metabolism, all done in the same subjects as you might expect. So when we look at our correlation analysis, that gives you the weight, the loading weights across different regions. If I compare that for FDG against our synaptic measure there, they're well correlated, but there's a good amount of variability around that line that you might see. So there's some of the same regions. So both of them are telling us something about that, that same disorder. And we look at where those, those regions we be looking at, they're gonna, we're getting that in areas that are sensitive to Alzheimer's disease in the hippocampus, precuneus, and prior. So we have some of those measures that go together. But here's what, it gets interesting there is if I look at the loadings of the canonical variables that we would get for a synaptic measure and a glucose, so loading it one or the other, we get very, very nice separation between the cognitively normal subjects moving into the MCI and the AD. And in fact, with this measure, we're actually able to separate out the MCI and dementia groups, which we cannot do easily with our, with our standard analyses with a composite region. So just by, again, bringing two together to increase what the diagnostic capability would be. But we can go further. So I mean, this, this shows that if, if I, the new measure that we're saying where we can separate MCI and AD, which we can't do either with FDG alone or with our just looking at our primary region in hippocampus, there's more to it. So again, adding more network information with multiple variables. So what's interesting there is, you know, I showed this relationship already that the synaptic measure and the glucose measure, they're correlated, but there's still a lot of differences there. But that can change a lot. If I compare our flow measure, the K1 measure, it looks exactly like FDG. And that's not a big surprise, just in terms of that. And so that was suggesting, well, Maybe we can just compare that, use those two. So here's where we're looking at our flow measure, synaptic measure, two parameters from one scan, able to get that out. And in fact, we're able to show that same kind of separation. So this is one where this proves an advantage. And in a sense, many, many pet tracers give you some information about flow. This happens to be a tracer where that's a really useful level of flow information. That's not true with, with everything that we can do. So again, being able to pair that. We do, have, of course, have to be careful that when we have two measurements, two data sets from one, are some of these correlations artifactual because of just collecting them from the same data set. All right, so let me look at that. A couple other ways in which we're merging together our synaptic measures with other measures in different populations. Major depression disorder, very relevant area there, long demonstrations of lo loss of synapses in postmortem data. And so we certainly showed some evidence of reductions of synaptic density, really in the, in the case of the high severity 
MDD. And although we focused on a few regions, anterior cingulate, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, this is something that's relatively broad in the brain in terms of that. But we also saw that we that very nice relationships here in the state about how their depression scores relate to this amount of synapses. The higher your more depression scores, the lower the synaptic measures that you get. And of course, in the same subjects, we're doing fMRI. And the particular analysis we do is something called intrinsic connectivity distribution related to other ICC measures, which we might think would be better. And so in those analyses, we're certainly able to show that some of the connectivity measures that come out of this, in this case between dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate, also correlate with HAMD. So if we put those together, what we're going to find is that we can look at the DLPFC synapses and how that's going to relate to connectivity. And that's what the kind of thing we want to be looking for. If we can look at, look at this in some kind of network where we can measure the source and the destination and the connectivity between them, begin to, and I hate to use the word validate, that's a little strong, but at least to give a little more confidence that we're, we're on, to the, on the right track with these things. Now here's one that's a little more complicated. Another tracer we've been using quite a lot is our MGLUR5 tracer, in this case, FPEB in major depression disorder. And, and part of that is really motivated by uh, the, all the excitement around ketamine. If you give ketamine, you can see a specific reduction in the binding. We're hitting exactly that target, which returns after 24 hours. So we were really expecting to see a lot of interesting when we merged our glutamate data with the synaptic density data. And we were interestingly surprised. So what we're showing here is, across different regions of interest, the correlations of the synaptic measure versus the MGLUR5 glutamate measure. And of course, you know, there's a lot of glutamate receptors. You wouldn't be expect to be able to see them. And if you looked at the, the, those loadings, of course, this is a, for a, a typical relationship there, what that would be. In the healthy controls here in green, you have a very nice positive correlation. All the regions correlate, and we lose it in MDD. This is a still small study, still something that we're playing with more, but just to see the network disruption that we seem to be getting here. And we have to understand, is this just a matter of variability in the tracer, or is this telling us something more specific to the disease? Too soon to tell, intriguing data. All right, let's talk a little bit about just general network structs, and I believe this audience knows more about most of this than me. Obviously, doing that with fMRI, doing the, the classic work for Professor D, being able to do that. So we said, okay, if we can do this with FDG, you can do this with fMRI, and we think we're measuring synapses, we should try. So in our first thing was to be able to say, let's take our synaptic measures across a large group, in this case, just healthy controls. Will we get the same kind of resting state networks out? And be able to do that. Uh, I will not, I had these pretty slides that uh, my postdoc made, who he was supposed to be here and give that talk, which I will skip, because I think you're probably mostly familiar with ICA in terms of the, the component loadings that you get and then the individual loadings. We got into ICA a few years ago when we did a study with PHNO. PHNO, dopaminergic, binds to both D2 and D3. In other words, the signal is a sum of two patterns. That's perfect for ICA. Can it find it? And this got me excited about it because it really kind of worked. It produced a very good D2-related source in the, in the putamen in the caudate, and then separated that out. So we look at the D3 binding, which is really heavily driven by the nigra and with projections in the globus pallidus. And by separating them out, when we looked at that in the population of healthy controls and cocaine use disorders, getting some interesting correlations with cocaine use years in the different systems where D2 going down, D3 going up. So that's a, this, is, this was an interesting one. It also was a, a data set that was perfect for ICA because the model says it's a sum of components. This tracer matches to two different targets. So we've got a total of 80 subjects now that we're done as healthy controls, and we're just doing a baseline rest scan of UCBJ to get our volume of distribution, our synaptic measure there, and trying to look for that and running it through the, the normal ICA pipeline. So just exactly what, what was done with FDG, Professor D went on. And, and part of it we're really looking for is how many patterns will we see, how many components, how reliable will they be. So we split the sample 40-40 to look to see how well that they would do. We also played with the different model order, and I apologize for this, this has been published last year in NeuroImage, and we were certainly seeing many of these components being very independent of the model order that we do. And when we looked at the uh, in quality of, of those components, we really were comfortable getting about 18 components out of this, which we could get pretty reliably between the two subcohorts of 40. And then, so here's those patterns. If we zoom in on the 13 that seem to look more, more reasonable to do resting state networks, and in several of them, we got a very nice correlation with age. We didn't see any sex effects in these data. Just kind of getting warmed up, just trying to say, is this something that might be useful there? Can we get a reliable pattern? Of course, now, what will it mean? 
Because when we looked at it, there was some correspondence with classical resting state networks or the FDG, but there were a lot of differences. And is that reflecting the difference between a state versus trait? And I thank, thank Dr. E for exactly setting that up. It was really nice because that's exactly that kind of thing there. So trying to understand where that would be. So where do we go from there? So the next step is to try to do this where we're doing a direct comparison between the SV2 APAT and the resting state fMRI. As you can imagine, you throw that kind of data set, there's a lot of results that you can get out. So we really tried to limit this in our initial cohort, and we were really interested in something where we have some kind of network where we can think about. And here we focused on corticostriatal work based on all the classical tractography that had been done in, the, in that area. Um, so that basically, without looking at every possible combination, limiting those components that we'd like to do. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do the, the fMRI component, and, the uh, SV2A, synaptic density components, we're gonna get the loadings for each one for each subject and be able to focus on just a few of these comparisons to see in what extent do they go back. So this is a total of, we have in this case, um, 34 subjects, standard resting state, same kind of UCBJ data. The, the variable we're going after is FALF and fractional amplitude of low frequency fluctuations. That's our, my MRI cap, that's our favorite measure there. Feel free to, if you think that's a good or a bad one, I will be happy to agree or disagree with you because this is their suggestion. But here we're also looking at the same kind of ICA loadings that we were able to get with, with the SV2A. So just bringing those together. So again, trying to do a small kind of select set where we're focusing on cortical striatal. So what we're looking for are networks that have some spatial overlap, that's one way of looking at it, or this known anatomical connections or things that have been really demonstrated previously with functional connectivity. So of the, I think we, we had close to 30, I think reliably probably about 20 from resting state networks. We're focusing on anterior and posterior default mode network, a sensory motor network, as well as some executive function networks control and salience. These five for which we have the loadings across our 40 some subjects. Of the many that we were getting there, we limited our, our looking at is just these three, a striatal source relevant to the corticostriatal networks, a nice uh, medial prefrontal source there, as well as a medial prefrontal. Again, things that are gonna be looking a little bit like default mode network. But this is very, I won't say subjective, it's motivated by, by focusing there, but it, it, it's not one that we're gonna be able to say too much about that one. So what did we find? So if I basically now what I'm looking at, let me scoot, scoot to this one, is across subjects, if I can look at a loading of a given subject in one network here based on the net log transform FALF compared to what we were getting in the PET network. And in the striatal network, we got some correlations with the default mode networks and a little bit with the salience network. It did not survive the false discovery rate. The interesting one was in that medial prefrontal network that we got. And there we found very strong correlations really across the board with these networks. And with two of them, the anterior default mode network and the executive control network that survived the false degree relative there. The parietal, we really didn't see much at all. And that was a little bit surprising. We were expecting that that might be one of our strongest ones. And part of this becomes the topic of, well, what are we measuring here? Are we measuring similar things or different things? If the resting state is telling us something about ongoing function, is the synaptic density saying more about trait? That is what that would be looking at. So lots of discussion there, repeating all those things. One of the really interesting things that we're in the middle of right now is remember we're measuring two me variables. Maybe what we should have been analyzing are the K1 images, the flow images, and looking at that as an analogy, the same way to FDG. Is that gonna show us a different pattern, is it gonna be showing us something very similar? Will a combination of the three be provide more interesting? And then the last topic is just to say, well, let's try to take this into a disease population and see what we go. So we're gonna go back to our Alzheimer's population. And that is now we're gonna be applying those ICA, trying to be able to say, what kind of components will we see? How will they begin to tell us something about disease, cognition, et cetera? So we have a population there of, um, of almost 60 subjects. Uh, where we're again using the uh, volume of distribution images that we get as a measure of synaptic density. And so what we're showing here would be, and now we're just staying in synaptic density, not with fMRI at this point, showing you those patterns which showed a statistically significant group differences either between, and I apologize, this is small, the cognitively normal, the MCI, or AD. And really two of those components were the ones that, that really jumped out, so let's focus a little bit more on these, because these are the ones that also showed significant correlations with various cognitive measures. So that, that is we have the loading weight compared to, for example, CDR sum of boxes or, or other logical memory kind of tasks. And, and the pattern's really interesting because we get a strong temporal lobe, we get kind of the negative going there with the frontal, and it seems to be cited in our population. That may just be a matter of the statistical cutoffs that end up, end up coming into play here. But trying to be able to get something which, again, 
automatically is going to help identify to separate groups as well as to predict some of the cognitive behavior. And again, of course, I see analysis was not told who are the healthies or who are, who are the, the, uh, the MCI and AD. And the second pattern, something's not quite as strong. So pretty much out of this finding that this one pattern in the synaptic program that being able to help predict all that. So let me just summarize some of this and I apologize for the speed because this is still pretty new and we are trying things and trying to say what can we do, how can we do something that makes sense. I think that's going to tie into the next section. How do we validate one of these things that we can do? So we have a very nice tracer. It has some excellent properties and it, we believe it is a good imaging biomarker of synaptic density, but more, much more work needs to be done. And when we're doing simple things, regional patterns, we are seeing changes in a many, many disorders. I showed you the AD and M major depression, we've seen schizophrenia, Parkinson's, HIV, et cetera, and lots and lots of animal models. So I think it provides us another tool to be able to look at that, and it produces that in an interesting way since it may give us two for the price of one. If we do the dynamic analysis, we're going to get some flow measure with K1 or a relative K1 and some measure of the synaptic measure with VT or DVR. But it's even better when we merge it with other tools, with a separate, another tracer, whether we're doing that with a, a like an MGLR5 where we're looking at a neurotransmission measure or looking at that at FDG or something very disease specific like tau. And of course, combining with fMRI is, is an obvious way to be able to go. And, and I'm really feeling like not just doing that in a resting state, but doing that more in the task-based stuff. So, so like most things we do, you throw enough data at it and it's interesting. You're gonna find some interesting and thought-provoking results and the question remains, how do we validate them? I cannot answer that question. I will uh, thank the great team and the funding sources, and particularly thank Xiao Tian Fang, postdoc, who should have been here giving this talk, but he had the nerve to get a job that wouldn't let him come here today. So those postdocs, terrible. Thank, thank you for thank you for your time. <laughs>
reliability of the two tissue model is not very good for this tracer because it is such a good one tissue model, one tissue tracer. Okay. So. Okay, we are actually Thank already you. out of time, so I would, I mean, let's continue, but one question maybe per person. Just <laughs> one? Okay. Hey, Rich, thank hey. you for a great talk. Um, I'm wondering, so when you see changes in VT with the SV2A, what is it actually we are seeing? Is it a change in synaptic density? Is it a change in vesicles, or is it a change in just the number of, are you any closer to knowing that this? Is the, that is, I don't know what unit of the whatever, what, what I'm very excited about is recently we've gotten funded a very good study to look both at postmortem existing data in AD as well as following longitudinally in people with fairly severe AD whose brains are going to be collected. That's going to be run by, by Banner. The work for all the electron microscopy, the array tomography, and all the other measures are going to be done over at Edinburgh and Terrace Fire Jones's lab. And we're going to be able to say a little bit more about that in the very, very early data that we saw. And it's, it's, and uh, hopefully she, she won't kill me that I'm saying this out loud. It looks promising. In other words, that what we're seeing there is we're not, for example, right, we are measuring a protein. How many proteins per vesicle? How many vesicles for synapses? Absolutely. And so far we're seeing that it, it appears that the SV2A per puncta is basically the same, but we see less puncta with it, with that measure. So good so far, way more to be done. And I'm very happy other people are doing it because I, it's really it, important second question. Really. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Ch how, how do uh, SV2A correlate with FTG? Because take the scena uh, scenario that you have an increased number of GABAergic uh, neurons and you produce an inhibition. Why are they correlated? I have, I have no reason to understand, uh, to think that they should be. Well, I, I think, it's, and it's true with all of our measures, you know, very true with FTG is if you have a progression of a disease, you are seeing the long-term effects of generic losses in that area plus whatever the in, in immediate functional state that you're seeing. So I still expect that we're going to see some of those correlations, but exactly, and I think we were hearing that already this morning, taking apart the, the state effects and the trade effects. We need, if you're going to figure out two things, you need at least two variables to be able to do it, surely more. We're also really excited about trying to merge SV2A with an, a good NMDA tracer, which we're close to having, and a better GABA tracer that we may have so we can look at excitatory inhibitory balance, which will be fun. Rich, yeah. I have just one question, the famous so what questions. Ah, so excellent. We, you, you have shown, and as the others, that uh, thanks to PET, oh, with PET, we are able to replicate some of the network that comes from the fMRI. But if I look at the literature from you know, the fMRI, they haven't been very successful despite 30,000 papers, whatever they have, uh, in finding reliable clinical tools. Yeah. Do you think there is a risk that we are trying to, you know, by coping or using fMRI nice. as a reference to get into a loop that we create nice networks while we're losing the specificity of the PET, which is like finding reductions, finding increase that are, they have biological explanations. Yeah. So what's, what, 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 what's your view on that? So I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it is a view. We have diff different ways of, you know, uh, it's the classical of the uh, blind people feeling an elephant. And what do you see on different sizes? And some are both feeling the tail and some are feeling a trunk and a tail. And those are, those are correlated, but they're different. Um, I think one of the tools by having multiple measures within PET is I think we're, we're really going to learn, we're learn, learn. Some of them are more consistent with the, M the fMRI, and I think the K1s and the FTGs will be more likely to be able to do that. But as we get to the more specific markers, the neurotransmission markers, we're going to be able to begin to take those apart. So it, 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 the, the subtlety, and it was already alluded to, is what kind of experiments can we do to begin to understand that a little bit better? I, project that we are in the middle of right now that's exciting is in Parkinson's where we're looking at in Parkinson's the region with the biggest reduction was the substantia nigra that was nice and what are we looking at synapses in the substantia nigra we're looking upstream we're using FEP to I look dope dopamine transporter in the putamen etc as well as looking at DTI and Nodi about the direct connectivity that's a nice simple circuit and I don't know how many variables it's going to take to help predict that along with the measures, but I think that's a good way to just reduce it to something where it's possibly understandable. We'll see. Rich, as far as I understood you, um, uh, there was a correlation between um, synaptic density and flow, so K1 versus a distribution volume of above 0 0.8. Mm -hmm. Is it not um, unexpectedly high? And the second question is uh, within the panel discussion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How would you interpret this ICI, ICA sources in synaptic density? Right. Um, so I think it's, a, it's 
we are, I mean, I think it's, we have a lot more to do to be able to find a validate to be able to interpret that. The, the um, K1 synaptic density is a little bit tricky because if they're coming from the same data set, they are intrinsically correlated statistically and we have to kind of remove that. So we're looking at the biologically interesting component against this, the, the statistical artifact. We can estimate that, but that's something we'd like to be able to figure out. Test retest studies are helpful if I can look at flow in one and volume of distribution in the other and we have a, enough data sets like that. Um, what is a synaptic? I mean, I think this is going to be reflecting the network changes the same matter as if we're looking perhaps at gray matter volume to the extent that it is gray matter a, a gray matter volume a, a good predictor consistent with synaptic density. We have some data that says maybe, maybe not. And looking across aging data, we see different rates of loss of gray matter as measured by FreeSurfer and partial volume corrected synaptic density across different cortical regions. So it's, it's an interesting thing. Again, two different components of what the ultimate net connectivity would be? Great questions. Okay, great. So since we are already five minutes late, I would start the general discussion. So I would ask Sin and Eric, to, oh, sorry, I killed the microphone, to gravitate around the podium. Um, and maybe we could catch up on the questions uh, from YouTube, Silvia. Okay. So the first one oh, okay. was for Sin. Maybe I think we can start with something this. Okay, okay. Okay, a question from uh, Sim. Uh, uh, for Sim, sorry. Um, great talk. Uh, when comparing co covariance matrices, uh, isn't the point spread function an inherent issue? A given ROI has different granularity between uh, T1, uh, AP, and PET, uh, limiting how much correlation matrix uh, we can get, how much correlation data we can get. So maybe the, the difference uh, about the resolution of these metrics that we are comparing, maybe um, you, an issue. Um, I'm not sure, so you're talking about the spatial uh, resolution or what? So th I, I think I, I have plot this uh, scatter plot, and maybe you can see that the, they are pretty uh, normally distributed. And also, we when we report the correlation, the correlation we use spearman uh, correlation. So it's kind of I think that um, it, it, first of all, it looks it looks like very linear uh, the correlation, the, the the distribution of the, the two matrices, and then yeah, and and we do not know for example the spatial. Uh, Resolution. If we have a you know more special, higher special resolution, then have more regions defined. That is, I think, an open question. Um, um, I, I don't know how how much would that is affect the result. Okay. The other question is for Eric. Okay. What do you think about the optimal way for signal normalization in the context <laughs> of neurotransmitter connectivity? Global mean, specific reference region, binding potential quantification? Uh, it's an excellent question and a tricky uh, issue. Um, for the, the, the study I have uh, presented, the uh, authors, and it, it was also the case of our study on uh, uh, that spec and on uh, fluorodopa PET imaging. For neurotransmission, we used parametric images uh, and parametric images on binding uh, potential. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if, the, of course, uh, there, are, there is an effect of the, the activity uh, normalization, but I think we have uh, no uh, uh, strong recommendation to uh, to make at this uh, step uh, for the uh, metabolic connectivity and the studies I, I have presented um, the the proportional scaling is uh, is largely uh, used on semi quantitative analysis mm -hmm. yeah. but it's a very important question I agree yeah we need to connect with uh, Eduardo Zimmer from uh, Zoom. Can you put Eduardo on screen? He wants to make a comment. Okay. Ek. Ek. Yeah, you yeah. 
Who wants to? Thanks for the question. I, I, we are hypothesizing the differences in gliosis are reflecting the differences we see with age with our SV2A marker versus, versus a, a gray matter marker there, that we, there is loss of, that the, the gray matter volume is changing differentially there. But uh, it, it is, you know, you are proposing yet one more measure and we have tools to begin to look at that in a reasonable fashion. And will they be, and I think this, this is gonna answer those questions really well if we're seeing very, very good agreement between what we would seeing in both regional differences as well as network patterns with a, with a astroglia marker compared to what we're seeing with these, uh, these other synaptic markers. So it, more to be done. Can I, can I reply to the, also to the question that Eric had about uh, normalization? I, I feel like sometimes we are throwing the baby out with the bathwater when we normalize, that we have to look at very carefully at methods where we can keep the global means as they are, okay? And I realize that changes things. Some standard ma machines require you to avoid those things, but I think that's something where, that's what we do well. We do something called, even when we're, not, even when we're using reference regions, it's still an absolute quantification, and it's uh, something we should be using a little bit better, and being able to say that. And, you know, the, the same thing when we look at our, when our, the SV2A markers, we're showing the ones with not just that were statistically significant, but they actually have a big signal that they're a significant fraction of the amount of synapses that would be there. We can say that, okay? So it's something, it's something we're good at. Okay, we have a question. I have a question for Eric. Um, regarding uh, the data change. Yes. Uh, do you expect, um, so you test that scan, right? So the one in front for the density. Do you expect the method to differentiate between neurodegenerative and non neurodegenerative Parkinson syndrome or also between atypical Parkinson syndromes? We have to identify a primary uh, objective for the prize because it's a financial prize. And uh, the first objective is to uh, distinguish between degenerative and non-degenerative. It's a very uh, elementary uh, issue, but we have uh, several uh, uh, other uh, questions to, uh, to address. But th the, first, uh, the first objective is basically to, uh, to distinguish between degenerative and non-degenerative. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it's a large collection of data and we hope to have a subgroup of uh, patients with MRI and uh, I think also with uh, FDG PET. So since we are going a bit into this tracer rivalry, <laughs> um, if you had to choose one tracer to investigate brain networks, connectivity, whatever. You can start, you have um, an infinite amount of budget, you can do anything. What would you do? What would you be interested in investigating? <laughs> My point of view, it depends on the, the clinical model, I think. But if we um, want to address um, um, an issue of neuroscience, for example, in a LC uh, subject, I think uh, we can uh, do uh, very interesting things with uh, FDG. We can start with FDG. <laughs> Infinite budget, okay. FDG is always the answer. Really? If I had to pick one right now, I'd pick one we don't have yet, a good, really good NMDA tracer. I think that really assessing excitatory is gonna be the most interesting. You could argue we should, we should be doing inhibitory and perhaps flumazenol could be doing that already, um, help taking that apart. But one is too few. We have, that's the point, that's our strength. Multiple measurements that we can do from one scan or from two scans in different tracers. 
vaccine. <laughs> no? You also pick, would pick FDG or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. No comment. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are there other questions? Yeah. Joanna. Joanna. You start or you will end this session. Sorry. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I have this annoying habit of uh, yeah, not keeping the questions to myself. Um, I was just wondering if you have any information regarding the alpha synuclein tracer. I have not seen many presentations about it. I know there are several groups currently working on it, but um, since you are experts, maybe you have some information regarding whether it will be available soon or not. There's going to be a talk about the MODAC tracer for the nuclear at the brain pet meeting. Ah, so. Did the ACMU look best in MSA? I think that's what I saw from what they, yeah, right. Okay, I think time has come for a coffee break. So we have 13 minutes, two minutes less because there were too many interesting questions. So see you in at three o'clock. <laughs> Thanks everyone.
It's working. So yeah. I believe we are ready for yes. the, se the second session. Um, I'm okay. Mattia Veronese, and I have the pleasure to co-chair this session so with uh, Joana Pereira, correct? Yes, absolutely. And um, I don't know, do you want to say anything about introduction to this methodology? Shall we just go through with, with the first speaker? Uh, sure, I would just like to quickly introduce the, the speakers. So uh, first of all, thank you for holding on for the next session. It's going to be a little bit different from the first one. And it's going to be focused on validation uh, measures for uh, back connectivity. And I hope you'll enjoy it as much as the first one. So as Matthias said, I'm, I'm Joanna. I work at Karolinska Institute. And Matija just told me uh, that he was working at University of Padua, right? Correct, correct. Okay. So uh, we are honored to introduce our first speaker, who uh, also uh, question, made a question uh, before. His name is Eduardo Zimmer. And Eduardo um, is, is, is quite prominent in the field. He has his own neuroimaging lab in, in Brazil where he's uh, working on trying to understand the mechanisms in identify novel biomarkers, as well as therapies uh, for uh, neurodegenerative disorders. And his lab is really multidisciplinary, as we have seen in many conferences, and collaborate with many uh, scientists around the world. So I would like to give a warm welcome to uh, Eduardo, who is going to give a talk about reproducibility. So Eduardo, can you hear us? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Thank you very much, Joanna. Uh, yes. 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 Working with, with astrocytes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so to start to start to tell the history, this is this is how I, I uh, this is the first time that someone invites me to talk about our network model. And it started with this, this messages with the path connectivity Twitter account that currently I know is an account that uh, Ariana is in charge of this account. And she asked me, how could we move from astrocyte to network? And she asked that because in, in 2017, we demonstrated that when we activate astrocyte, we, we, we increase fat uh, FTG signal in the brain. Five years later, very recently, in a study coordinated by, by Andrea Rocha, which is a PhD student in the lab, we demonstrated that by deactivating astrocyte, we decrease 
FDG PET signal. We, we mimic the hypermetabolic, the glucose hypermetabolic that, that we see in neurodegenerative disorders. But in these two works, we realize that by that the activation of astrocytes causes a, a transient disturbance on, on, on PET metabolic networks. The activation, the same. So in these two conditions, when we activate or deactivate astrocytes, we have this, this disruption, this transient disruption in, 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 in the PET FDG uh, connectivity. And one of the first things that, that was really remarkable is that these networks are really, really unstable. Uh, this is an example of, uh, in the paper that we activated astrocytes, this is a baseline condition using SUV or SUVR with the cerebellum as the reference region. As you can see here, uh, the, the architecture of the, the, the fat metabolic network changes if, if we change the, the analysis. Of course, we have this, this expected uh, hydrogen correlation if you use SUV. And after the astrocytic activation, we have exactly the same. We can see that the phenomenon is still here. We have this, this, uh, this transient disruption in the path of the gene metabolic connectivity, but this, this network, they, they changed a little bit. The architecture of these net, this networks changed a little bit. And this was the very first observation um, that these networks are unstable. So I recruited two very talented students, a, a mathematician, uh, Dr. Yuri Rodriguez, which is now a postdoctoral fellow at the University, University of Success, and Guilherme Schultz, a physicist, uh, which is now in Switzerland doing his, his PhD. And we decided to develop a method for deriving more stable metabolic networks. And of course, the, the first problems are, are very basic. So for people that ceased to work with this, these networks, uh, of course, that, that sample size matters. So we are, we are dealing with uh, the correlation coefficients. So uh, we know that if we have different uh, uh, sample size groups, groups with different sample size, we are going to have, uh, potentially have uh, uh, issues in computing these, these correlations. And we realized that reference region matters. We work basically with, with FDG. So if you use the pons or the cerebellum, we have <coughs> different, uh, network ar architecture. And we also realize that these networks are really, really susceptible to outliers. They're very vulnerable to, to outliers. The first one is, is, is not simple, but it's, it's easier to, to, to solve. Uh, we can use balanced set groups. Um, the number two, uh, we can use always the same reference region. But the third issue uh, the susceptibility, the vulnerability to outliers is more complex. Uh, 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 it's a more complex task, task to, be, to be resolved. Then we decided to, to develop what we call the, the multiple uh, uh, sampling method, the MS method. If you want to check the, 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 full, the full manuscript, it's already posted uh, on bioarchives as a preprint. And I'm going, I'm going to talk a little bit about that a little bit about this work. So the, the, the main objective, of course, is to develop a more stable fat FDG metabolic networks. And for doing so, we use data available on ADNI. ADNI was already introduced before. And we divide these individuals using their, their, their diagnosis, their, their clinical diagnosis. So uh, cognitively unimpaired, myocognitive impairment individuals and Alzheimer's disease individuals. And I'm going to divide this, this, this method in, in three steps. The first one is basically what everyone does when it's working with, with fat networks. So we do all the imaging processing. We, we extract the values, values of the volumes of interest. And then we go to the, the, the step number two is the computation of, of the, the uh, correlation coefficients. <clears throat> so what we did here, so basically we do, uh, we start doing the, the, the same uh, correlation, but after that, we do a, boot, a bootstrap sampling. So, uh, which is a method that does this, this random sampling with replacement, which means that we remove some individuals and then duplicate, triplicate other individuals. And we do, we do that 10,000 times. So we have around 10,000 networks. 
And after that, we compute the mean network. And after computing the mean network, uh, we choose the real network that is the most similar to the mean network. This is the, the network that, that we use as the, the group representative network. In terms of thresholding for multiple, multiple comparisons uh, correction, we opted to do, to do two things. And the first one is basically we do the, the usual FDI uh, uh, correction, and then we got the, the, the FDR corrected matrix and multiply by a probabilistic map of 99%. So what we have here uh, basically is the, the, the network that survives after all these, uh, these procedures. Of course, this method, this method was developed to try to, to have a, a more stable, a more group representative network. And we need to test whether our network was more stable than, than the conventional method. And for doing that, we decided we decide to use what we call the, the network model outlier attack, which is an adaptation of the, the node uh, outlier attacks uh, uh, method. And basically what we do here, we start to include outliers uh, and see the, the, how the, the, perturber the similarity of the perturbed networks with the network before the inclusion of outliers. Who are these outliers? We include, for example, in the, in the CU group, we include uh, uh, MCI, in the individuals, in the AD group, uh, the opposite, we include uh, uh, CU and MCI individuals, and then check the similarity uh, uh, between these networks after the, the, the inclusion of uh, outliers. For doing so, to compare non-perturbed and perturbed networks, we opted to use, use, use a, a few metric measures of uh, uh, metrics of stability, and for the similarity of matrix, we decided to use the, the uh, Frobenius, which is uh, a metric used to compare similarity uh, uh, between matrices, and the house of distance, which is a uh, metric used to compare similarities between images. Uh, we also use a metric to use similarity between uh, features derived from matrix, uh, from matrices, which includes the Euclidean, a distance, which is the, the most used metric for evaluating similarity, and the Canberra distance, which which is uh, is also used for measuring uh, similarities. Uh, and there's a paper showing that it works very well for, for for measuring similarities between graph measures. So the idea here is to use this this uh, this metrics, this this similarity metrics, as an index of stability. Uh, and of course, for doing that, we decide. Uh, to use, uh, uh, we decide to, to use three different uh, uh, um, populations. The first one, since we know that that these networks are very susceptible to, to sample size, we use three strategies here. The first one is using the uh, adaptive synthetic algorithm, which is a, 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 an algorithm that generates synthetic data. So to, to have all groups with the same sample size, the other one, we use the under sample, so we reduce the number of individuals to, to the number of the, the lowest group, the smallest group. And uh, lastly, we, we try this imbalance of groups. And this is what we found. Here we have the first uh, result with the Euclidean distance, and this is before the mood, the mood, sampling, uh, mood sampling scheme method, and here after bootstrapping with the uh, mood sampling scheme method. Uh, as you know, uh, closer to zero means that the network is more similar, is more stable. As you can see here in the three groups, we have in the three groups and using the three strategies, we, we, we uh, considerably reduce the, the distance or the vulnerability, the susceptibility, susceptibility to outliers. We also tested using the other metrics. Here we have uh, for Binis, uh Hausdorff and Canberra, and we, we got exactly the same results. So we reduce the vulnerability to outliers. Uh, just to explain, I, I think I, I didn't explain very well, we include two, five, and 8% of outliers uh, uh, when we do the, 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 the network attack. And after that, we realized that the method was indeed providing more stable networks. We decided to, to validate the, the method in an independent cohort. And then we did that in using the, the, the cohort of the University of Sao Paulo, 
and the School of Med is the School of Medicine cohort, which is a much smaller cohort. And as you can see here, we, we have exactly the, the, the same results. So we are able to significantly reduce the, the susceptibility to outliers. Using the other metric, the, the, the for being used, the uh, Hausdorff and Canberra, we also have very similar value, very similar results. Another thing that, that we, we decide to test, since we have more stable cohorts with the, uh, stable networks with the, this, this method, what's, what's the impact on sample size? Can you have a stabilized network with a smaller sample size? And this, this is what was very striking for us. This is what we have uh, using the conventional method. As you can see here, we need around 100 individuals to have a, a stable cohort, a stable network, a network that is, is, is resilient to outliers. And with the, with the method that we developed, we need much less individuals. And this is replicated with the other distances here. Uh, we can see that we need much less individuals to have stable networks or networks that are less vulnerable to, to outliers. If we're going to be very conservative, we need around like um, 50 individuals to have uh, uh, a very, very stable and group representative uh, network. Of course, we validate that again in the, in the, in the Sao Paulo School of Medicine cohort. As, as you can see here, we have very similar results. Using the, the, the sample size much smaller here, here we have 200 individuals and here we have 30 individuals. And and we, we found uh, similar uh, results. If you check the other distance, the results are uh, similar again. We reduce the, 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 the number needed for, for have a stable and group representative uh, cohort. Uh, what we found using our cohort and what we are going to do right now. So we found something that people already demonstrate in the literature using the, the multiple skin network, we found that we have this, this metabolic uh, uh, hyper uh, uh, synchronicity as Alzheimer's disease uh, progresses. So the connections, the, the network becomes like less connected as this is progresses. What we are doing right now, we are comparing the network that we have, that we, that we construct, that we build using uh, ADMI with the network that we are building using other databases to see if we have any, any meaningful uh, uh, biological information. The other thing that we are doing, uh, we already established the same method for, for small animals. So we have a code for, for rats and, and mice, and the code will be available very soon on, on GitHub. We are finalizing uh, the first the preprint is there, but we are finalizing the, the first version of the paper for, for submission. If you want to, 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 if you want to work with the code, just, uh, just contact us, but, but the code will be very soon available on GitHub. And I, I think that the, uh, the concluding remarks are that uh, we are able, able to produce more stable metabolic networks, networks that uh, are, uh, that can better resemble that, that can be better group uh, representative networks. So uh, we also realize that we are able to, to produce these networks using uh, a reduced, reduced sample size if you use the, the multiple scheme uh, method. But what I think it's important is we are talking about that before is the, the, the biological interpretation of these networks. We're trying to understand uh, what these networks mean, and, and as, as mentioned before, we do that comparing uh, the, the, the metabolic network with fMRI data, and we are probably measuring different biological, uh, different biological phenomena. So what I think, and, and the most important thing, as already mentioned by, by Professor Carson, is that we need, we need to do multi-tracer multi studies and, and to compare these networks to really understand what these networks are trying to, to say. So this is, this is my group in Brazil. It's a very big group. Uh, currently we have 33 students. We are in a brand, brand new building in, in Porto Alegre. Uh, a 
I'd like to thank all the collaborators that participated in this study, uh, people from the uh, uh, Hospital de Clinicas of Sao Paulo, which, which are, uh, uh, provided us all the data for, for the validation. Uh, we are very active on Twitter, so this is my account and my, my lab's account. So if you are interested in astrocytes, brain imaging, neurodegeneration, follow us. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Eduardo. Uh, the paper is open for questions. Chris? Okay. I really enjoyed that. I think that was great. You know, by the way, I, I've in totally different contexts. I have observed that you can effectively double your sample size with bootstrap aggregating, but it doesn't really matter here. My question is, why do you take the one that's closest to the mean rather than mean directly? And then the next question is kind of the elephant in the room. What about brain behavioral associations with any kind of clinical or cognitive endpoints, do they replicate better out of sample if you use these bootstrap fortified networks? Oh, we, we cannot hear him. Try now. <clears throat> yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah, this is this is a this is a great question, and we opted to use we, we tried with the mean, with the mode, with the median, and the results are very similar. So what we decided to do is to, to use the, the, the to not use a synthetic network, to use the, the one that the real one that is closest closest to the mean. But if you use the mean, the results are are, are very similar as well. The, the idea of using a real network, not a network that we created uh, like the perfect uh, uh, network, right, for, for represent uh, 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 the group. In terms of, of uh, information related to, to, to any information related to cognition and, and any information related, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the other question, but if these networks, they, they give some, some information uh, associated to cognition, to, to clinical symptoms, that's it, that's correct? We are still in a phase that we would like to see if, if after using the same the same uh, mood scheme method for for building for constructing these networks, we are going to have similar networks. So the next step, what we want to do right now is to is to use the the, the network that we have from Admin, use exactly the same regions, and do a similarity analysis with the network that we have from San Paulo cohort and from other cohorts. The idea is to see if we can have. A, if this if stability means that the networks are more, uh, 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 means reproducibility in terms of different cohorts. So this is what we're trying to do right now. So to be very honest in terms of if the network gives anything related to, any information related to cognition or I'm, I'm not sure yet. For this, well, thank you for this inspiring presentation, okay. Uh, did you study the outliers and the behavior of these outliers? Why they are outliers and um, in clinical population? I mean, are they, mm, they particularly affected by clinical variability or specific subtypes? This is a great question as well. So what we did here, completely random. So we, we just like attack the network with two, five, and eight percent of outliers, and these outliers they are clinically defined. So we can refine that if we use, for example, uh, measures of pathology. If, if we use uh, amyloid positive, uh, tau positive individuals, we can refine much more if we use the biological definition of Alzheimer's disease. But what we use right now it's complete, completely random, and we included. AD individuals clinically diagnosed AD individuals in the cognitively unimpaired cohort. And we did the opposite uh, for, 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 for CU, we included AD in CU, included CU in AD. 
So they're clinically diagnosed. We don't know about the. I think that the heterogeneity can 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 have a, a, a can impact on that. But as I said, it's completely random. We just randomly choose the the, the individuals and, and do the the the, the network attack. Thanks for your nice presentation. Um, I have some questions uh, mostly to understand what you did, to see if I understood it correctly. So what you call outlier is a subject or is a network that is too different to the mean network? It's, it's a subject. We included subject to construct the network. The second question is, yeah, you use uh, different measures to calculate similarity between networks. I was wondering, uh, what's the added value of each of these measures? <coughs> yeah, this is a good question as well. We decided we decide to use uh, uh, metrics that are used for, uh, uh, to measure similarities of different, uh, for example, uh, the, the, the Euclidean is the most used. The Frobenius is used for, for measuring similarities of matrices. The Hausdorff is used for measure similarity, for evaluate similarities uh, uh, between images. So the idea is to, is to use different distances and to see, to see if our method was able to reduce the, 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 the vulnerability using all the distances. But we decide to use uh, different uh, distances. And have you considered using, uh, using just correlation, like Pearson correlation between matrices or a spatial overlap between them? No, this is a good question. Yeah, but but yeah, we can we can do that. I I don't think that we did that, but I think that we can we can we can evaluate persons. We can do that. We can evaluate the direct uh, 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 similarities between matrix based on persons correlation. We didn't do that, but I think that we can do that. It's good suggestion. A question. Um, okay. Um, you are interested in testing the repl replicability of your results in different cohorts, right? But um, did you assess test retest reproducibility of the networks? Did you? This is a this is a, this is a good a good a good comment. So what we're doing right now, we are we are evaluating two additional cohorts, and and we are still replicating data in the two additional cohorts. But as I said, the first thing that we are interested in is to measure the, the similarity between the, 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 uh, the group representative matrices to see if we are at least having uh, uh, similar results uh, uh, among cohorts. This is two quick questions. You want to go ahead? Very quick. Your, your results regarding the reference region? Yeah, we are using the, 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 the same reference region for all analysis. So this is one of the variables that we realize that if we change the reference region, we change the, the, the architecture, the, 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 the pattern of the, 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 the network. So we are using always the same reference region. In probably, or gray matter, global gray matter. No, I think it's, it's the cerebellum that we're using because uh, the, the cerebellar gray matter. Give me the cerebellar gray matter and with the pawns. So I'm not sure uh, which one we, did, we, we, we included. In the, we have two included in the paper, so, but it's always the same reference region. Question for you. Many thanks, Eduardo. When we uh, compare patients and uh, LC uh, subjects, we found a decrease in connectivity, but we can also find increase in connectivity in patients that are usually interpreted as a possible functional compensation. Do you have evaluated the impact of your method on this uh, possible increase of uh, connectivity? Yeah, this is, this is a great, great question. So we, we, we see some increase in connectivity in early very early stage of Alzheimer's disease. So we believe, as, as I mentioned before, we believe that, that uh, there's something going on with, with glial cells in the beginning of these disorders. So we believe that astrocytes are reactive, microglial cells are, are activated. We don't know if they are activated or if they proliferate. I don't know if we're following the, the, 
the recent paper on PSPO showing that PSPO is not an index of neuroinflammation, but an index of microglia density. So uh, we, we believe that we, 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 in the beginning of these disorders, it may be the findings that we have is that we have hyper connectivity, hyper synchronicity. In, in, and we believe that this is related to the activation of, of flyer cells. Another round of applause. Okay, so our next speaker is Aldana Liga, Lisa Raga, and I apologize for that. She's a PhD candidate at the Technical University of Munich, uh, Germany, where she's working uh, on the relationship between uh, different MRI and based measures of brain connectivity, uh, as well as uh, static versus functional PET. But for today's uh, talk, she will focus mainly on concurrent validity. So please go ahead, uh, Aldana. Thank you, Shona, for your introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aldana Lizarraga. I'm a PhD student at the Technical University of Munich. And um, first of all, I would like to thank Ariana and Igor for inviting me as a speaker today and for organizing this amazing symposium. I will talk about recent results on similarity and test retest reproducibility of PET and MRI-based measures of brain connectivity that, uh, as you will see, support the use of PET in the field of uh, connectomics. So for those who are not familiar with brain connectivity, I would briefly define brain connectivity as a study of the relationship between different parts of the brain. Uh, typically modeling the brain as a network where macroscopic regions are related to each other through links of a certain weight. And it can be mathematically represented as a, what we call an adjacency matrix. So in the case of the human brain, to study it in vivo, um, we use different neuroimaging techniques that allow us to uh, inspect the brain organization from different perspectives, since each of them uh, leads to a distinct uh, nature or meaning of these links. So, as Ayana said at the beginning, the number of studies uh, that use PET or positron emission tomography for brain connectivity has increased in the last decade, and alterations in metabolic networks have been found in several diseases like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, cognitive impairment, um, epilepsy, just to name a few. However, PET is one of the least exploited techniques in the field of connectomics. So why use FDG-PET for brain connectivity? With FDG-PET, we can measure the glucose consumption of the neural cells, which is proportional to the uh, synaptic activity. It means that uh, brain connectivity estimated from FDG-PET um, uh, aims at measuring the coupling in energy consumptions between different brain regions. Therefore, it might serve as a measure of functional connectivity or communication between regions. However, most of the functional uh, connectivity studies uh, nowadays are based on fMRI, which, as Ariana said, um, means that our current perspective of functional connectivity disproportionately relies on a single uh, point of view or on a single parameter, which is the ball signal. Um, and it might be restraining our understanding of the human connectome. If we compare FDG-PET to bold uh, fMRI, we can see that it has uh, some well-known disadvantages like the spatial resolution, the static nature of its data by default, the radiation exposure, just to name the most important disadvantages. But the FDG-PET images can, um, through FDG-PET we can measure neural activity in a more direct way than uh, through bold images, which actually try to infer neural activity from a complex interaction between rates of glucose, blood oxygenation, and blood volume. And on top of that, FDG-PET has already a well-established clinical applicability for diagnostic that fMRI still doesn't have. So MRI 
prevails in the study of brain connectivity. Uh, specifically, fMRI is commonly used to estimate functional connectivity. Diffusion-weighted images are the only imaging technique that allow us to infer um, gray matter um, bundles, um, so structural connectivity in the brain. And structural images like T1 images are commonly used to measure gray matter covariance. I will explain each of these uh, modalities uh, more in detail later, but the point is that uh, nowadays it's known that all these networks are interrelated to some extent and they present some degree of similarity and this similarity has been used previously as a means of validation or corroboration of these modalities. But regarding metabolic connectivity, still important networks, important uh, aspects uh, remain unclear. So for example, to what extent does structural connectivity underlie uh, metabolic connectivity? Or um, how close is metabolic connectivity to functional connectivity or to gray matter covariance? And um, apart from that, so on top of that, um, only few studies attempted to quantify the test retest reproducibility of metabolic connectivity. And to the best of my knowledge, there is no direct comparison between MRIs and PET-based measures of connectivity in terms of reproducibility. Uh, having said that, um, in this presentation, I would like to answer uh, two questions. One is to what extent is metabolic connectivity similar to MRI measures of brain connectivity? And the second one is how reproducible is metabolic connectivity in comparison to MRI measures of brain connectivity. To address these questions, we analyze data from um, a multi, uh, multimodal uh, protocol, so a simultaneous PET and MR acquisition performed in 56 healthy subjects that were scanned twice, eight weeks apart. So after 30 minutes after injection of about uh, 100 megabecquerels, um, the subjects were scanned in a um, PET-MR biograph, MMR. The MR protocol lasted for 30 minutes and included T1 images, diffusion images, and resting state fMRI data, plus additional sequences to correct for susceptibility and attenuation correction. And we used the first 30 minutes of uh, PET data to reconstruct one single image per subject. Um, to work in the native space of each subject, we obtain a nonlinear transformation from the standard MNI space to the T1 space of each subject. And then um, linear co-registrations were performed between modalities. Uh, we use for all modalities the same gray matter parcellation that was an adaptation of the AAL2 atlas that consists of 106 regions, including uh, cortex, subco subcortical structures, and cerebellum. To estimate uh, metabolic connectivity, we use the most common approach, which is to perform an inter-subject uh, regional covariance analysis, uh, but this is not the only way to do it. Um, um, as it's going, you will see later, there are some attempts to um, infer metabolic connectivity from individual uh, data, so at individual level. So from now on, I'm going to use the term FDG covariance in order to be more precise. Um, so we extracted from each region the mean FDG uptake, normalized uh, this value for, for the total gray matter, uh, gray matter uptake, sorry, and correlate, uh, calculated the co uh, Pearson correlation across subjects. So as a result, we obtain a single group connectivity network, um, weighted and undirected, and this was the distribution of the connection weights. Uh, structural connectivity was inferred from probabilistic tractographies performed on diffusion data. To do it, you have to perform some corrections that are typical uh, for this kind of images. Then we fit the ball and sticks model, which is a multi-compartmental diffusion model that assumes that in each voxel, the diffusion of protons can be um, explained by a compartment with isotropic diffusion and two compartments with anisotropic diffusion to, re to represent the axonal um, populations of fibers. 
And then we perform probability stratigraphy using a YMAT seeding approach that consists of starting streamlines from all voxels in the Y matter and propagate them until they reach the gray matter. That was our, our target. And uh, they were excluded if they reach before the CSF mask. As a result, you obtain um, a probabilistic tractography, in our case in the T1 space, um, that is basically a 3D representation of the axonal uh, bundles. And we use as a measure of connectivity at individual level the number of streamlines uh, connecting to regions normalized by the surface of the region to take into account that the larger the region, the more likely it is to be reached by a streamline. Uh, so we obtain a structural connectivity network at individual level, so for each subject, and the connection weights were exponentially distributed. They span uh, several orders of magnitude, which is consi consistent with the literature. So in order to construct a group uh, connectivity network, we resampled this distribution to a Gaussian distribution, and we calculated the mean across subjects. After that, we... Um, apply a threshold of consistency to the network, removing those connections that were not present in at least 75% of the subjects. So in these histograms, you can see the connections in blue, the connections that uh, survived the threshold, that had uh, are Gaussian distributed, and those that were removed in red. Um, the resultant network had a sparsity of 65%, where sparsity is the number of null connections divided by the total number of positive, uh, possible connections in the network. Functional connectivity was estimated from a time series of ball data measured with resting state fMRI. And um, after some more or less standard preprocessing steps, we extracted the mean ROI, um, mean ball signal per region um, calculated the Pearson correlation between pairs of, of regions, calculated after that the um, Fisher transformation of the correlations values, and then the mean across subjects. Finally, we brought them back to Pearson correlation coefficients. And this is the connectivity matrix that we obtained with the corresponding distribution of the connection weights. The last um, measure of connectivity, gray matter uh, covariance, was obtained uh, from T1 images measuring the volume. Um, different uh, morphological features can be used to estimate structural covariance or gray matter covariance, like the, the area density or uh, cortical thickness. So since we use volume, I will refer to it as gray matter volume covariance as I did for FDG covariance. So, we segmented T1 images into different tissue maps, and we used the gray matter um, probability map to calculate the volume of each region, of each um, yeah, region. Then we regressed the total um, gray matter volume and calculated the Pearson correlation across subjects. As a result, we obtained this uh, adjacency matrix, only one per for the entire group, uh, with this distribution of uh, connections. To measure the similarity between these networks, we used um, the Spearman correlation coefficient between connection weights, uh, which measures to what extent the relationship between these modalities can be explained by a monotonic function. And we also measure the spatial overlap of this network um, after binarizing them as, at, at a certain sparsity level. Um, for that, we use a measure called conversion ratio which is the percentage of common connections divided by the average number of connections in the network, which would be similar to the dice coefficient. Um, so first I'm going to show you the results to, of similarity with structural connectivity because we treated the structural connectivity as a kind of reference since um, it's, it has a good reproducibility, it can be obtained at a single level, and it's indicative of an actual connection, at least to some extent or in theory. Um, so as you can see, correlations were uh, positive but weak um, to fair, and all of them were significant since we have a large amount of data points. 
and it was maximum for structural connectivity and FDG covariance, followed by structural connectivity and functional connectivity, and the last one was structural connectivity and gray matter volume covariance. Uh, correlations among uh, proxy measures of, of connectivity uh, were also um, significant and positive but weak. It was maximum for FDG covariance and functional connectivity, followed by functional connectivity and gray matter volume covariance. And the last one was gray matter volume covariance and FDG covariance. Uh, these result are, results are surprisingly similar to those that show D in, in his presentation. Um, the, in addition, as I said, we measured the spatial overlap between networks, and for that, we um, threshold the networks uh, in a certain sparsity range. The lower limit of the sparsity range was imposed by the structural connectivity network, and the upper limit is the maximum sparsity that still give us connected networks, which is a common approach to restrict the sparsity range in this uh, kind of studies. Um, in addition, we calculated the convergence ratio that is expected by chance for two random networks. And uh, as you can see, the convergence ratio in all cases was higher than by chance for the entire interval, but decreases with the sparsity. Um, however, the distance or the difference to the random component actually increased with, with the sparsity, which means that when we remove the weakest connections, we tend to be more spurious the networks become less random, which is, uh, makes sense. Um, and to quantify the amount of overlap over the entire sparsity range, we use, uh, calculated the area under the curve and normalized it by the sparsity range. So it was maximum for structural connectivity and functional connectivity, followed by structural connectivity and FDG covariance. And the last one was structural connectivity and gray matter volume. Um, spatial overlap between um, proxy measures of connectivity was calculated over the same sparsity range and um, they show a similar behavior. Um, it was maximum for FDG covariance and functional connectivity, then gray matter volume covariance and functional connectivity, and finally FDG covariance and gray matter volume covariance. So we obtained the same ranking of relationship than we uh, obtained with uh, Spearman correlation coefficients. And at this point, it's worth it to uh, mention that um, this result show that FDG seems to be closer to functional connectivity than to gray matter volume covariance, with, which contradicts what was stated in previous studies uh, that um, suggests that FDG covariance correlations might be just spurious uh, correlations resultant of um, acro performing across subject statistics. Um, Another thing that I wanted to point out is that maybe you already noticed that the convergence ratio um, to structural connectivity was maximum for functional connectivity, while the Spearman correlation was maximum uh, with, to FDG covariance. And this is not implausible or contradictory because different connections are being considered in each analysis. So to calculate uh, convergence ratio, we use the strongest connections that are shown in red, um, so all of them were positive, while to calculate Spearman correlations, we use only structurally consistent connections that could be uh, positive or negative in, in these surrogate networks. And another thing that I wanted to share with you is that we performed some additional analysis to test the robustness of our results again processing steps. So we repeated this analysis um, omitting the Gaussian resampling of the structural network, also omitting the uh, thresholding of the network, applying a more uh, liberal threshold of 50% instead of 75 to the structural network, regressing out the distance between regions, and uh, we also replicated the, the results at the second time point. Um, unfortunately, there is no time for me to share all these results. I will just uh, show the results uh, for the last point because it's very nice to see how um, CR, the plot of CR versus sparsity can be replicated at a different time point and we obtain um, actually the same ranking of relationships. 
um, to test uh, to assess test retest reproducibility of these measures. These are preliminary results. Uh, we use first. I need to clarify that we measure the reproducibility at a group level because we don't have individual estimations of FDG covariance or uh, gray matter volume covariance, and for the same reason we could not use the most popular measure of reproducibility, which is the intra-class correlation. Instead, we used the Spearman correlation coefficient and the coefficient of variance that are both uh, used in the test retest uh, reproducibility literature. Uh, well, you're already familiar with the Spearman correlation coefficient. The coefficient of variance measures the dispersion of the data points around the mean, and the higher the coefficient of variance, the lower the reproducibility uh, or the precision of the measure. Um, so a Spearman correlation coefficient between test and retest measures of connectivity were high in all cases. I don't know if you can see the numbers, but it was maximum for structural connectivity followed by functional connectivity, FDG covariance, and gray matter volume covariance. And it can be seen in the scatter plots that the weakest connections have uh, more viability. So uh, those that are close to zero. Uh, coefficient of variance was calculated for each connection in the adjacency matrix. Um, since the sign of the, the coefficient of variance is um, not meaningful for reproducibility, we took the absolute value of the coefficient of variance and we explore, we plot how this um, absolute value of the coefficient of variance um, depends on the connection weight because by definition it's um, dependent on the, on the mean of the test and retest measure. And we saw that the strongest connections have a lower coefficient of variance, so they are um, more reproducible for all modalities. We also uh, plot the scatter plot of this coefficient of variance using all possible connections in the network and calculated the, med the median and math for each modality because they were not normally distributed. Uh, we obtained that structural connectivity had a much better reproducibility than the other networks. And for functional connectivity, FDG covariance and gray matter volume, the reproducibility was similar. Um, Finally, uh, we wanted to compare the percentage of connections that were significant in these networks because sometimes the significant level, so the p-value of these correlations is used to threshold the networks to remove spurious correlations uh, for functional connectivity, FDG covariance, and gray matter volume covariance. So, um, in addition, we measure uh, what was the percentage of significant cor correlations that were also reproducible or had a good reproducibility. For that, we um, defined as significant those correlations that had a p-value, uncorrected p-value below 0 0.05. And um, as connections with good reproducibility, we took those that had a coefficient of variance below 10% based on the, on the literature. And as you can see, well, you in uh, each row correspond to um, a session and a modality. So uh, one means first time point and, and two second time point. As you can see, FDG covariance presented the highest uh, percentage of significant connections and also the higher percentage of significant and re reliable reproducible connections. Um, so to summarize this presentation, I would like to answer the questions that I presented at the beginning. Uh, so to what extent is metabolic connectivity similar to MRI measures of brain connectivity? Um, we can say that FDG covariant was uh, associated with structural connectivity to a similar degree as functional connectivity. And FDG covariance was more similar to functional connectivity than to gray matter volume covariance. And these results were reproducible and robust against processing steps. Um, the second question was how reproducible is metabolic connectivity in comparison to MRI measures of, of connectivity? What we saw is that despite methodological differences, test retest reproducibility of FDG covariance is similar to that of the established fMRI-based uh, functional connectivity. And FDG covariance has a higher proportion of significant correlations than functional connectivity and gray matter volume covariance. 
Altogether, these findings support FDG covariance as a measure of functional connectivity um, for the brain. I would like to thank the people that contributed to this work and thank you all for your attention and for being here. We have time for a few questions. Thanks for the very useful presentation for all of us, I think so. Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you try to kind of to, to do a joint model of the correlation between the FDG and all the MRI modalities that you try? No. Okay. No, no. And which uh, mask do you use for your analysis? I mean, a gray matter mask or a whole brain mask? Uh, what, what atlas, you mean? I mean, yeah, the atlas is clear, but do you mask, I mean, just the cortical areas or? or uh, do you, um, probability maps, you yeah. mean? Uh, we generated them with SPM, so. Okay. I mean, okay. And do you yeah. check the, like, the effect of this threshold on your results? Uh, no, that would be interesting. We apply a threshold of 0 0.5 to generate the gray matter mask. Yeah, but um, okay. could be tested, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, I think the correlation between test and retest is really impressive. Mm. Uh, right, very, very high. Um, so I have only one comment. Like, I think the ROI of use, the AAL, is really too big. And then if you average the, all the signals within the, uh, the, the regions, maybe it's, you cancel out a lot of functional meaningful information. In functional MRI, really right now, it's kind of a, a push to using AL to study the brain, to, to define nodes. Yeah, yeah, we had a, like, perform additional analysis to decide what atlas to use, and we decided to, to use AL2 because the region, since they are, uh, they are wider and larger, the atlas is more robust against nonlinear registration. What we saw is that Nonlinear registrations in general are not perfect. So if you use an atlas that is where the regions are well defined, like glassa parcellation or Harvard cortex, um, Harvard Oxford, sorry. What happened is that there is no when you perform the transformation, there is a lack of overlap between the atlas and the gray matter of the subject. So what we did was to use the AL2 and to make sure that we only included gray matter, we uh, applied a gray matter mask to the atlas. Okay. Richard? Quick question. Um, thanks for the very nice presentation. How much of all these correlations might be the artifact of the standardization when you put everybody into a template space that would also be common across the different measures that you have? Um, yeah. you. You, may, you mean how much is due to the uh, spatial embedding Spatial, of exactly. the of mm -hmm. the networks? Well, we we try to take into account the, the distance by regressing now the Euclidean distance. Uh, it's, it was one of the additional uh, analysis that okay, we used um, in the robustness analysis. Maybe I don't know if I can come back. No. Um, yeah, what we saw is that in general, yeah, um, the similarity between networks decrease. So part of this similarity is explained by the distance between regions. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, if there are no other questions, I would like to thank Adan again. Okay, so our next and last speaker for this session is Professor Christian Habeck from Columbia University in the US. And he is working on developing uh, neuroimaging biomarkers, not only for aging, but also for psychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases, uh, multivariate analysis, and also robustness analysis for pre-processing functional MRI data. Today, he will give us an overview on covariance analysis related to PET imaging. So please, uh, Dr. Habeck. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have found this uh, symposium very uh, informative, and uh, I've learned a lot. I think, I think you guys have a real chance to make this 
as sophisticated as fMRI resting state uh, connectivity analysis, with, but without the danger of sort of drifting off into liberal arts with computers, you know, I mean, so I, I, just to echo some of the statements from earlier. So I, I am today, Igor gave me a very uh, lot of latitude here. I actually have not worked with pet data since 2012. So, so I'm, I'm going to deal with fMRI and simulated data because I also mainly work with cognitive aging and normal people, so not so much biomarker stuff anymore. But uh, I'm often in danger of forgetting to thank people, and uh, I like this kind of Buddhist mantra, uh, you know, that, that says there is no I in fMRI. Uh, somebody said that once, I thought it was great, and if, for PET I think it works even better. There's an, there literally is no I, letter I in PET at all, right? So thank you for Igor and Ariana to bring me into the fold in this wonderful enterprise, and then there are many people I have to thank uh, over the years uh, that have helped me um, in my research. So yeah, so it's going to be in some ways, I'm going to go back to the time when I was a poster, with, which is a very long time ago, but maybe not a generation ago, but a long time ago. And, you know, there's a chat, this might to some people be quite trivial what I'll talk about, but hopefully everybody will get something out of it, you know. When I, when I went into neuroimaging, it, it was still kind of, uh, univariate analysis was still kind of what people talked about, and multivariate analysis often raised eyebrows. People thought it was, it had no good type 1 error control, you know, you would always find something no matter what, you know, and that, that was when I came into the field. And just to start here, um, <clears throat> just, just very basic, we're going to only deal with cross-sectional data today, and then later we have, a, if for fMRI, we have something where we have repeated measures. But just to orient everybody, um, so let's assume that we have a data matrix Y, and it's such that we have a number of voxels that are the numbers of rows here, and numbers of participants. It could also be number of participants times tasks, right? But what you see here, that there are many more rows than uh, columns, right? So the, the data is rank deficient by, by design. You know, so I mean, maybe in the in the future when we have true population neuroimaging, this will not be the case anymore. But uh, the data sets I deal with, even though they sometimes have thousands of observations, it still lasts mainly rank deficient, right? And so this was the state of the art when I came in. It was kind of like Windows being very dominant in the PC world before Apple came in. So everybody was still doing univariate analysis running linear models, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm not here to disparage it, you know. It's just, when I came in, there was this weird culture war where people thought univariate is good and multivariate is bad, and, and um, the two are just looking at different aspects of the signal. It's not a matter of better or worse, right? It's just two different ways. They're, in a way, incommensurate. But what you could maybe remind yourself, what's a simple, um, so we're running linear models row-wise. For every row, usually you would relate, you know, the signal that you have <clears throat> to some design matrix X, and you would get parametric maps out, right? And um, just, it's kind of trivial, but it's maybe good to remember that because of this rank deficiency I talked about, um, usually you only can pick V, you know, the number, you know, the number of, of linearly independent things is usually n minus 1, right? So as soon as you grab n rows, they're going to be linearly dependent, right? That's the nature of the rank deficiency. So, so univariate analysis, in a way, is inefficient when you want to predict some outcome measure from the data because, because you're going to run out of degrees of freedom at some point, right? So... For biomarkers or when you want to predict something out of sample, it's probably like, so this is a very trivial uh, reason for using multivariate analysis where you look at correlated activity in the data, right? It has to be there just by, by simple, dumb dimensional analysis, you know, even before thinking about connectivity, right? So multivariate analysis is the way to go for this purpose, right? And uh, again, this is all kind of definitional, right? We, uh, for any multivariate decomposition, doesn't matter whether it's PCA or ICA or non-negative matrix factorization or what have you, you can make your own 
right? Usually we have um, a matrix of brain images, right? That's, that's our components that we have, right? And the number, again, the, the rows indicate voxels. The columns indicate the number of components that are retained. And then we have a, a score or mixing matrix, or subject score matrix. And uh, usually you want to, you know, there's residual we want to get rid of because, you know, that contains noise or some activity that isn't parsimonious, really. So that's the generic shape of any kind of multivariate analysis. It's nothing new here, right? And just to write this out, let's assume we have 10 components here. So here would be those component images, and here we have our score, or mixing matrix, and as I said, the possible choices for the decomposition. I've, I've often mainly used PCA because I understand it the best because it's in a way the simplest, where you just impose orthogonality on the columns of V and the columns of W. That follows automatically because these are dual spaces. But you could do other things, independent component analysis. Spatially means that these columns in V are, are independent to all orders. And um, as I said, you could do your own thing, right? You could impose your own, um, your own constraints. You know, you could, I mean, in the psychometrics literature, people use sparsity principles. They, they do oblique loadings. You could do whatever you want. The one thing I would say is don't confuse mathematical convenience of the decomposition with scientific meaning. And that's... Some of the, the early ICA work that I've seen where people have applied ICA, they just gave, they just, you know, interpreted components purely on account of their topographic decomposition without ever relating it to mechanisms or predicting anything out of sample. And you have to say, um, you know, these decomposition principles work very well. They also work very well just on noise, right? So in order to make sure that you're really capturing something <laughs> You should really, it should give you either mechanistic insight that you don't have beforehand, right? Or if you, you could also say, look, I'm agnostic to, bio, to, to mechanisms. I just want to come up with biomarkers. Then the biomarker should work, right? And you should be able to put it to the test, right? So my workhorse has been PCA, and I'm going to, the, the scaled subprime, scaled, uh, a uh, subprofile model has been mentioned already. I'm going to refer to this again. But just let's remind ourselves uh, what I think is a very nice visual aid for PCA is the scree plot. You can see here, um, if we do this decomposition, if we normalize these scores one more time and squeeze all the eigen, what's called the eigenvalue matrix here, lambda, that is a diagonal matrix which contains the 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 variance that each PC contributes. And you can see here, I'm going to show this in real data, but here uh, I love simulating data because it always works out really well and I understand why. So, but here we made up some 10 sources of variance, you know, for just this is mock data, you know, 800 people on 10,000 voxels. And when you make up 10 correlated sources in the data and you add just voxel noise, you see this scree plot and it gives this sharp transition, right? So you see that, oh, you know, there are 10 things, 10 independent sources going on in the data. Everything else is kind of noise. And we would just use IAD noise, no correlated sources in the data at all. You get this kind of flat line you see in the orange, right? And it's roughly because it's normalized to some to 100% in the aggregate, it's roughly 1 over 800. So 1 over the, the the rank, data rank there, right? So in real data, as you could imagine, this never works out this way, but I'll go back to this slide that has already been mentioned. I think it's a beautiful slide. It belongs in an art museum, I think. This is from uh, uh, our very own Igor, published this great uh, review several years ago. And this, I think, is a very nice empirical demonstration why, if anything, Covariance analysis should work even better for PET than for fMRI because of the variance concentration. And I think Eric already mentioned this. As you can see here, either in the scree plot or the cumulative variance plot, you can see that PET concentrates the variance much, much better than, uh, 
fMRI. And we, instead of using 14 principal components to capture the aggregate variance of 50%, we only need two for PET. So PET already looks more, I mean, it looks, it, it seems to be multivariate already right from the outset because of the wonderful uh, variance concentration, maybe coming from signal averaging, you know, when you acquire resting data. Um, so again, we go back to the, uh, the SSM uh, technique, which, uh, yeah, this, like with Stanley Rappaport's and Horwitz's work, you know, it's, it was conceived of in the 80s. And I talked to Jim Muller before this talk, and he was very keen on letting you guys know that there's also a modeling component where the PET signal is decomposed multiplicatively into a global scaling factor. Then there's a mean image that's the same across the group. And then the last thing is this residual activation that contains true subject by voxel interactions. And it's actually interesting, when you do this kind of decomposition, you can apply a log transform and then the multiplicative variability turns into additive variability. And any scaling that you do to a particular reference region doesn't matter. It will always give you the same result. So that was also part of, that was part of the intellectual input into this technique that sometimes gets lost. So let's assume we have this multiplicative variability. Then we just do a PCA step and uh, we do a brain behavioral regression. So it's a kind of supervised PCA or sometimes called PCA regression. And we can derive a pattern that correlates, whose subject scores correlate with an outcome, right? And again, this is maybe the, uh, this is the ultimate objective. Uh, I just, again, it's maybe totally obvious, possibly trivial, but ideally we'd like to reduce the data array into a component here. That component is the same across subjects and just captured voxels. Voxel, it's non-isotropic, right? And we have a score. Uh, so, and this score should really correlate with the cognitive endpoint that you are interested in, right? So that's really the goal of our, um, <clears throat> of our technique. And uh, again, simulated data because they work out so well, but this is from a while ago. There was a didactic paper just to, again, uh, sort of remind people why multivariate analysis works usually quite well in brain data when you have distributed effects. And this is a two-dimensional example uh, because you can better see it. So you could see here there's a pattern here. Uh, it's these two adjoining squares, and it's a zero-one sort of binary loading pattern. And we make up these Gaussian uh, sort of subject scores, right? And so we assume this is mock data, right? Call this young or old, or it's like a dichotomous group uh, difference. And now we add Gaussian pixel noise. So every, every one of these uh, 10,000 pixels gets uh, noise superimposed. And then we can see how well can PCA retrieve these effects and how does it compare to univariate results? And you can see here, when we scale up the voxel noise, you can see here this works pretty well, you know, but then at some point we're losing, we're losing the effect and here, here there's nothing left anymore, even when I don't correct for multiple comparisons. So the distribution of the signal means that at some point, even when you add a lot of noise, here's what happens when you do PCA, the first principal component looks like this. So there's some of the noise gets incorporated, but you can clearly see still the uh, adjoining square structure, right? And we still see a clear group difference, you know, in the data. So that's, again, this might be for many people, you know this already, but this came at a time when people are not yet convinced of the virtues of multivariate analysis, right? So you can see it works well when there's a distributed signal. If there's just a real focal part here, then this whole thing might not work so well. And then the multivariate consideration of voxel by voxel correlations doesn't really help you. Okay, so the nice thing, and, and again, the, again, this is simple, but it's maybe good to remind people, is that uh, as long as you sliced into the same voxel space, right, so you have the same, the same coordinate system, you can derive any pattern that you uh, 
You can derive a pattern and then prospectively apply it to any data set. Doesn't matter whether the data set generated the pattern in the first place, right? Doesn't matter. You can just do this kind of dot product and you get a score vector out and then you can test uh, your correlation with an endpoint you know, of the pattern and that's a really nice feature that sometimes people are forgetting. So uh, I'm going to skip this because we don't have much time. I, this is just, I wanted to convince you that this also works in fMRI data, that the multivariate technique works much better than univariate data. You have to take my word for that. But okay, so let's, this is a very old paper. Uh, this was 015 PET data and the SSM technique was just applied. There were some <clears throat> controls, uh, age match controls, and there were some Alzheimer's, early Alzheimer's patients. And we derived a pattern that just distinguish with the SM SSM technique between the controls and the, the IDs. And then we prospectively applied this to these group of MCIs or questionable dementia patients. And you can see that they also nicely sort of showed the correlation with the CDR status, the clinical dementia rating status. And in these, these, you also got a negative correlation with a minimental score and the selective reminding test. And because of the particular normalization of the SSM technique, there are regions with positive and negative loadings. This is relatively preserved regions, whereas these get, get worse with um, AD status. And so a nice, a nice forward application then, I think, was this follow-up paper where you could dichotomize the MCI people and they, they weren't used to derive the pattern at all. But then when you followed them in time, the ones that expressed the pattern to a higher degree declined more quickly. Whereas the ones you know, that you know, showed the, the expression to a lower degree, they sort of stayed up better, didn't decline quite as much. So I thought that was a nice that was a nice um, demonstration. And I'm not going to, uh, also somebody quoted the Eidelberg group. They have done fantastic work, I think, with really bringing SSM on the map for good out of sample um, uh, replication. So the last thing is, and this uh, Igor asked me, so do you have any kind of insight about group level covariance versus intra-subject covariance. And I, I had to say, no, not really, but let me at least play with our own data. And, you know, given that dynamic PET is now available, strictly speaking, you know, since the onset of resting research, network connectivity usually assumes associations or correlations within subject. Didn't used to be that, you know, that there wasn't such hygiene in the terms. Plenty of people use functional connectivity uh, even for a cross-subject analysis. I, I've used the term many times, um, but after 2010 or so, it seems to me you can't do that anymore. Um, so, so the different ways of treating inter and intra-subject variability could have large could have large implications. I mean, we see in the first talk today that the two seem to be very very nicely aligned. In fact. I thought I was very impressed by that. So even though it doesn't have much implication for PET, we can at least try to play with this in fMRI. And it's maybe good to remember, again, this is mock data, you could have a cross-subject covariance where you just look at the, the activation of power in two nodes. Just to make it simple, imagine you have two ROIs. But now I shift them, I shift them in time where the correlation now goes basically to zero. So the connectivity really could change a lot, although the activation doesn't really change at all, untouched. So that means your within subject connectivity really could be much different than the across subject covariance. And here's the converse where there's nothing in the, sh in the, uh, the connectivity between the nodes within subject. I just scaled the signals but that has big implications for power, right? So you can see how these two things could happen somewhat independently and your across subject covariance might give you much different results, right? And just to make this totally obvious, again, this is marked data. Imagine we have, again, only two regions and I now have 50 subjects and they're color coded in different colors here. And 
this probably doesn't happen in real life, but I've just made it such that the across subject covariance of within subject means, you can see that direction, it goes this way, right? You would have a, you know, a somewhat, the correlation would be the really <laughs> negative correlation between the regions. Whereas the mean within subject covariance gives you this direction. So this would be a very curious case. I'm not saying it happens ever, but here you could see where the two might give you very different answers, right? In fact, they're orthogonal. You, you'd infer much different correlationships between uh, the results. Okay, let's go to the last slide, well, the last analysis. So we can maybe try to put this to the test. Uh, this is my own study. I have 290 participants with 12 fMRI tasks. Doesn't matter what these tasks are. But we can now do different levels of analysis. We can first do a within subject uh, covariance. And then, no, no, sorry, within subject mean across these 12 tasks, and then do the PCA across subjects. So in other words, we get the PC one of 200 mean subject in emissions. This is kind of like a PET-like analysis. Then we can do the converse, where we do covariance <coughs> within subjects, but average across those 290 uh, subjects. And then the last thing is we... Um, we compute the PCA across everything. So we, we just you know, pool the subject and task maps and we have 3,480 observations. We just get the PC1 of all of this stuff, right? And then robustness of loadings in all cases was done with bootstrapping. And uh, what's interesting, uh, let's, let's first, this is threshold at a Z uh, bigger than three, you can see cluster size is 100, you can see the positive loadings are, are red and the negative loadings are blue. And similarly to maybe this, uh, the first talk, there isn't, at least topographically by eyeballing, there doesn't seem that much difference, right? They seem quite similar. In fact, if I threshold them more stringently, you can see that the first PET-like analysis at some point loses, you know, it, it doesn't have quite as much of robustness as the other techniques, but you can still see there's quite a, quite a good topographic correspondence. And you can even do something further. You could just take, you can take the, the mega PC1, the one that's, you know, when I treat it, I just pooled all the subject and task maps together. You can, you know, apply, prospectively apply it into all time points, uh, into all task and subject data and look how well it goes along with the subject score of this, this PET-like PC1 of the mean effects. And you can see that there's pretty good correspondence there too. So also here, there doesn't seem to me that much difference between within and across subject variability, which in a way is good. And the other, on the other hand, it kind of undermines somewhat the rationale for doing within subject um, repeated measures. But anyway, so. I've taken up enough time, so I tried to give you some basics. We went back to basics of the, the mechanistic, uh, the way that multivariate analysis works and why it's justified, you know, particularly for PET data. Uh, the rank deficiency argument, I mentioned that, showed the superiority of PET versus MRI. Uh, Taken Igor's uh, review paper then out of sample replication which was uh, discussed. And then the last thing, I just tried to play with within versus across subject networks and uh, fMRI data. But um, I mean, there, there are no hard and fast answers, but at least maybe, maybe I've given everybody a way of trying to formal, formalize this, explore it in your own data. Okay, and I think that's it for me here. Five minutes time for questions. Very easy questions, please. <laughs> I have just a comment. Uh, <laughs> uh, great talk, Chris. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, you started very modestly, mm. but I, th I think it's, it's very important to, to keep in mind this relationship between 
uh, statistics, multivariate analysis, mm. and um, mm. uh, which underlines most of the analysis in the field of brain connectomics. And to keep in mind the proportion of variance that uh, certain network or component mm. um, explain, and um, as you always say, out of sample, uh, mm -hmm. uh, out of sample replication is uh, important, especially for clinical purposes. Right. Very important. Thank you. Right. Many thanks for the talk. Um, how do you interpret uh, individual PCA score? Is it a, a measure of uh, connectivity at individual level? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, in a way that I have used it always with one, with one observation per subject, that's hard to say. I would, well, it's literally something like the covariance across regions, right? So you, again, it is a kind of similarity measure. In fact, when you use spatial, okay. spatial correlation, it often looks very similar in, to, the, to the subject score. So, so I wouldn't go as far as to say that, but it, uh, you could probably think that if things don't work well together, then probably the, the subject score should be low, because in other words, you wouldn't you wouldn't really confirm in a spatial sense to the template that's given by the covariance matter. So maybe, maybe, but you need to verify, yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, our um, online chats are currently not working, uh, but uh, yeah, I have a, a final question. Um, so uh, Christian, you, uh, your main conclusion, or at least one of your main conclusions is that there were no differences in between uh, regarding to within subject variability in, in this example in, in this, this example. example but this is uh, what I wanted to ask you about mm. because um, so the initial part of the talk used a lot of simulated data and uh, in this example it consisted of a single subject the 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 last yes the last, with the, the real brain data. yeah yeah no, uh, no so they were there were 290 subjects participants and they had 12 fMRI tasks each. So it's a bit of a stretch to say it wasn't, this wasn't time points, right? But it was a repeated measure. There's also one thing I should say, the trait differences, we're talking about trait and state differences. These are lifespan data. So the people range from age 20 to 80. So there are probably a lot of trait differences in there. So I found it surprising that the, the variability was that well aligned. But to what extent this would be the same for dynamic pad, I, I don't know, I don't know, mm -hmm. no. I find it interesting because I'm, I'm currently involved in several projects with dynamic mm -hmm. fMRI connectivity, which uh, you're mm -hmm. most familiar with. Mm -hmm. So I have not done the same with dynamic pad. So in that sense, I'm uh, has, as right. unexperienced as you are. And I see a lot of differences at the individual level. Yeah, actually for, actually for, yeah. So for with, for within the thing subject is within, sub, with, within subject fMRI connectivity, particular resting state, I, I use this here because I had two, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get the example worked out uh, in time, right? But there probably, arguably, there are a lot of differences. You know, I've, I've personally observed, you know, so I've done multivariate analysis on connectomes, and sometimes this looks quite different from, you know, if you just took the first moment within subject and did covariance analysis. So there, there are a lot of trade effects in resting state connectomes, I think. So yeah. that, that definitely, in my anecdotal experience, seems to be true. Yeah, it is true. So maybe this is something we should look it, uh, into in the future. Because if it exists in fMRI, as, as I have seen uh, in my group, uh, there is a possibility that using some finer measures, I mean, even basic uh, method analysis like the sliding window approach, um, I, I've seen a lot of changes that were not appearing in static PACT when it comes to, sorry, static fMRI when it comes to comparing AD patients and controls. Right. So it would be interesting to include these as well as a suggestion for the future. 
But uh, yeah, I'm terribly sorry the chats are not working. Uh, otherwise, there will be plenty of more questions. And yeah, thank you a lot. Uh, yes. Thank you. I think at the other we are perfectly in time, so it's coffee break, isn't it? Perfect. Thanks a lot. Yeah, but look at this. I don't know. I try to do control alt suppress. Yeah, not even if you get it back with people by Ah, yes. Uh, can we ask the speakers and faculty to have uh, just a quick photo sort together? No. no.
Eric? Du, äh, okay. Mike ist on. Was? Also. So let's start with the third session where we're talking about functional dynamic PET for estimation of brain connectivity. And we'll start with uh, Professor Alessandra Bertolda, who will be talking about dynamic PET. Okay. Okay. My name is Alessandra Bertolda. I'm coming from University of Padova in Italy. Uh, thank you, of course, uh, for having invited me to this uh, in interesting satellite event. So let's start. And uh, this is my outline. A little bit strange outline, if you want, because it's full of questions. And uh, in true, I'm going to deal with uh, how to quantify PET connectivity from dynamic PET data, how many PET connectivity maps, uh, can we generate, this is I think a critical point uh, that uh, I wanted to stress, uh, how to derive PET connectivity at single subject level from dynamic PET data, and first, last, but uh, for me, a first question, how to validate all the maps that I, I can obtain. So a lot of questions, and uh, in true, I can give a spoiler, I have just only a few answers to this, so I think uh, there is some uh, some stuff uh, uh, on which we can work together try to give a more answer that, uh, that uh, I can give now, just right, right now. So my talk is, uh, sp is about dynamic, pa sorry, okay, it's dynamic path uh, connectivity, so I deal with uh, uh, time activity curves uh, derived from bol bolus injection methods, so that's, that's uh, the classical, uh, most uh, used approach to obtain, uh, uh, to follow the behavior of a tracer inside a tissue, in particular the brain. So it's supposed that you inject the tracer in a sort of short window time, so between 20, 60 seconds, it depends on the tracer, it depends on, of course, of the facility. And you can follow for the same time to zero the kinetics of the tracer, having uh, the full dynamics here. And after what we can do, we can uh, use uh, the time activity curves as, uh, you know, themselves themselves, sorry, or we can quantify them. So we can use some uh, uh, the right compartmental model. In this case, uh, and also in the following slides, I will use a lot of FTG uh, kinetics, uh, FTG results, because we are working on this type of data sets. And okay, so we suppose that we have a very right compartmental model. We need, of course, input function or reference tissue model, and we can derive some microparameters micro like this one, this the K1, the K3, for instance, the, the um, KI. And uh, we will work on, on this. So, so we can work with time activity curves, we can work with the microparameters. So bolus injection method is the most used, as I already had said, is uh, possible to, is usable <laughs> to quantify microparameters, and also is able to describe all the average resting state processes. Um, but uh, is, we, have a low, we have to deal with data with a low spatial resolution. And this is true, but of course it depends on the quality of uh, your construction algorithm that you use. It's, so you use so you can improve also the spatial resolution of your uh, data if you are able to use of course some more research based uh, reconstruction algorithms in any case it's true we have a low spatial resolution and low temporal resolution so we can we have to balance this two type of uh, information that uh, and to try to understand which is the best method to perform apathic connectivity by using this type of data set so we have to first uh, to uh, you know face uh, methodological issues uh, because one can say okay you have a time activity curves so like in fMRI we have uh, the signals and so you you have a just to, to apply the Pearson correlation and that's all but uh, in true is uh, we have uh, we have to face with a multicollinearity of a time activity curves. Uh, this is, uh, for example, this means that, for instance, we have FTG dynamic data, and we can parcel it or just to derive a region 
of interest uh, time TV curves, uh, averaging the voxel inside the, the specific areas. And uh, if you just uh, to have a representation of the same figure of, um, in this case, uh, R4, um, for time activity curves uh, coming from different four ROIs, uh, is evident that uh, when you apply correlation, normally you obtain something like this that is uh, unusable, so it's uh, just okay. The scale is uh, rising from minus one to one, but mainly you see red, value, red values, so, so it's impossible to detect, to separate any. Uh, networks, uh, impossible to speak about segregation, integration, whatever. Even if I'm going to specify the matrix, uh, the result is uh, without any uh, information for us. So how to quantify? We already have seen, but uh, now we have a time activity curve, so I, I, we can use microparameters derived from modeling, but uh, we are, mm, the results are across subject uh, results. So we have average maps, average path connectivity maps. And uh, in any case, it could be interesting to, v to have them. And we can, we already have seen, we can uh, use a covariance. So we can use a personal correlation in this case. We can use ICA, we can use a PCA, we can use also size, that is a model based method to derive a, a covariance between the, the, the data. And, uh, but uh, I will show also some results uh, when I'm going to use uh, directly time activity curves. In this case, uh, I can provide, uh, I should be, I can provide single subject uh, path connectivity maps uh, by using similarity metrics. In this case, uh, I'm going to, will show you some uh, results using similarity, different similarity metrics and size. And of course, uh, even we ca in this case, we can use uh, other type of approaches uh, like PCA, like uh, ICA, but I mean, I will go in just to, to show this the results. So first, uh, just to remember us uh, the, what we already have seen in the first, uh, um, the first presentation is the core variance. Uh, and I'm going just uh, really briefly to re um, recall us uh, the pathway and also the results. So we have, uh, the, for instance, the micro microparameters, the K1, deriving in this case of FTG. We, can, we have uh, subjects, uh, we are uh, regions coming from an uh, atlas, for instance, uh, based approach. Uh, we are performing some type of normalization because sometimes we have uh, uh, data coming from different scanners uh, also. Uh, it's better to do, to perform some type of normalization. So uh, after we can apply on this uh, da data set, uh, we can apply, uh, apply pairwise uh, correlation between regions, obtaining this type of matrix that, that now is, uh, you know, is more close to what we have when we are dealing with resting state fMRI data. So it's possible to, to have some, to visualize some blocks of, of um, correlations, so networks. We can <coughs> speak about, uh, we can now speak about again segregation or integration between networks. We can also use uh, p-values or uh, something else uh, to threshold the matrix that is uh, something that is normally used in fMRI, but it's not only because it's fMRI, it's because uh, our network, brain network is not fully connected. Uh, we know that there is a small world uh, uh, description of our, uh, at, at least uh, by priori knowledge that we have, that uh, our network is described as a small world connectivity. So we have uh, to specify the results uh, to keep just only what is really, um, you know, um, reasonable and, uh, you know, robust and so on. Yeah, after we can arrive to a representation as a graph and apply some graph group, graph matrix. Okay, as uh, we already have seen this uh, slide and uh, I remember we have, uh, we can apply this not only by using a of course, FDG by using other type of tracers. In this case, we have a dopaminergic and serotoninergic tracer. And in this case, uh, there was a study comparing the reliability, so re test retest reliability of uh, this type of, part of um, method. And was, uh, I mean, we can just uh, give a, a look at the maps and say, okay, this is uh, group one and group two, there is a good uh, reproducibility of the results, why here we can just be more questionable of the, the, um, what we have, what was done. Um, 
and uh, of we can, uh, why we wanted to perform this? We can perform this, uh, okay, because we have a pet connectivity, but we, we can use this type of maps in order to classify different type of groups, uh, like here, healthy, MCI, and, and the patients. It's uh, clear that uh, the mm, three different uh, connectivity maps are telling us something in order to, um, that could be used, useful, useful for the classification of um, of uh, subjects. Uh, in any case, uh, we can also uh, derive some more quantitative uh, differences between uh, the three different maps uh, using some uh, graph uh, metrics uh, like uh, the strength, uh, cluster coefficient, or, or entropy. Okay, this is something that we already have seen. Uh, the question is how many pet connectivity maps uh, can we generate? Because uh, we can do exactly the same by using, for instance, I'm telling you about uh, the same pool of subjects, the same pool of uh, time TV curves. I'm just uh, performing the quantification. So I can quantify the, the pet connectivity by using SUV, R in this case, or by using the KI maps. Uh, remember you that KI for FTG is uh, really supposed to be closely related to S SUVR, is, uh, but uh, KI is a quantitative measure, so you have a, a unit of measurements. So it, it's uh, telling you a, a global vision of a metabolic state of a, of a brain. And I can repeat a exactly covariance uh, method on K1. And uh, it is, the, um, is related to um, blood flow and the extraction fraction of the BBB. So it's a, a mainly uh, the interface between the blood and the, and the tissue. We speak of, um, not only speak about the FTG, but in any case, K1 is more related, uh, uh, strongly related to uh, um, blood flow. And uh, the K3, that is uh, strongly related to the enzyme activity. Uh, so the phosphorylation process of FTG. So uh, in this case, of course, uh, was, uh, we apply a um, specification, uh, uh, keeping just only the 20% of the uh, highest value in this case. So uh, the scale are exactly the same, um, going from 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, so we can really disentangle information, we can disentangle the, the level of correlation. And if you give a look, uh, we have uh, different type of representation of the networks. So different type of, uh, uh, if you look here, SVR seems to be similar to the KI, even if uh, we can uh, see uh, some differences between them. And, um, but different is a K1 and different also a K3. So we have a sort of a four different variables four different versions of a metabolic connectivity and again are coming using exactly the same derivative curves, the same pool of subjects. So what, what question is, are all these four, five, if, you add, I, if I add also the K2 uh, parametric maps, are all these four uh, maps useful in terms of what? In terms of probably of uh, you know, for classification purposes, could be that they are just only four possible features that we can uh, use for some radiomic uh, uh, study, and this is fine. But speak about connectivity, speak about uh, the meaning of this. Are all uh, usable, are, you, are all related to the con con uh, some information about connectivity, or just only part of them, or full of them? So, and, uh, the fact that they are different uh, can be also quantified by, for instance, applying some uh, graph-based metrics uh, like uh, we wanted to identify the hubs. This is something that is uh, normally done in fMRI resting state. We quantify the function connectivity maps and we want to after to, in the, um, you know, just to characterize which is the most, uh, the most of the, the pool of the most important nodes, speak about uh, their relation with uh, the, their relation with the network. So we can identify using, uh, we can use the degree matrix. So, so just uh, use, um, trying to understand which is the node that is more connected to the other one. So it's uh, really important because it's speaking is, uh, you know, Having, is supposed to have a, an activity really strongly correlated to a lot of our nodes of a graph, 
Uh, but we can be also more conservative in the, this uh, localization, perhaps including also some eigenvalue centrality. So in this case, the hubs are identified by using these two uh, graph metrics. And, uh, and it's not surprising for me, but uh, the history, so the uh, descri description of the graph in terms of hubs is different uh, when we are referring to uh, different uh, uh, supposed to be fat connectivity maps, uh, in particular the K3 maps is, uh, uh, you know, telling us that the network structure is remarkably different from the other three, at least the three maps, uh, highlighting what is uh, frontal and um, frontal parietal and subcortical areas uh, as the areas including the hubs, uh, at least the hubs related to the <coughs> enzyme action of FTG. While the other three uh, maps seem to be more close to each other, so this means that also from, uh, you know, if you wanted to uh, give an interpretation of uh, these maps in terms of functional connectivity, SVR, KI, and K1 are more, um, you know, giving you a detail of, um, of a network are closer. So suppose that SVR is uh, more closer to, you know, think about that SVR path connectivity maps is, uh, is giving, is telling, is describing network. Uh, similar to what is uh, described by using the K1, that is uh, something more related to the hemodynamic whatever behavior of a tracer, while they are different from K3. This is concept that I want to stress. We have to think about this. Uh, we, can't, we cannot say just only metabolic connectivity. We have a several ways to stress, to highlight, to, you know, to say this is metabolic connectivity. And, uh, okay, of course, uh, we can repeat this, uh, and I'm going really fast because uh, we already have seen the example coming from uh, the Richard Carlson Laboratory, so the use of ICA, that is a really nice approach, I think. And uh, they were able to identify some networks, uh, and we are also uh, happy because some por 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 portion of its networks are uh, close to what we obtain by using the resting state fMRI network, and we can also investigate the effect of aging. So, but in any case, even if uh, we are using ACA, the same open question remains. So if uh, I can use ACA with K1, K3, SUVR, KI, whatever, and probably I will obtain different type of uh, uh, networks, like I obtain different type of uh, packet connectivity maps. <laughs> And so again, the open question is the meaning of what it is. And uh, okay, now probably I switch to what is the most different part of the presentation, that is how to derive pattern connectivity at single subject level from dynamic PET data. So we are here, we are using time TV curves, uh, and we, we, we want to use similarity metrics uh, or size approach. First, size, just to remember us, is a model-based method able to, quanti to quantify the um, covariance inside the uh, you know, pool of data. And uh, um, we can apply also this type of uh, method we use in time TV curve. We have adjusted to, to deal to overpass this uh, um, this uh, constraint that we can use, so the constraint that uh, when you use a size, for instance, using SVR is, uh, is, is perfect to match, but using time to is no match, but we don't have a normal distribution of the data, but we can deal with this. We have uh, some different uh, type of uh, estimators that are able to, in any case, uh, to derive um, a covariance relation to quantify the correlation between the data, but uh, keep into account that we don't have a normal distribution of the data. So I'm not going inside the math of this, but just to stress and to say the differences by when, I, when you apply a size with SVR methods, so, and uh, when you apply with time to be curved, we have to think about the estimators. 
In any case, this was a preliminary study that was published last year, and we are working also in improving the data set. Was, here was performed on four subjects, and now we are dealing with a different data set coming from Washington University with 80 subjects. And we are performing more of well, the same stuff. So in any case, here, four subjects. Uh, the full uh, FDG mm, dynamic data, and uh, we have uh, we uh, use uh, two uh, different atlases. One is the Schaefer plus uh, the subcortical ROIs coming from the Schaefer. The Schaefer is uh, really well known in a resting state of in a, you know fMRI uh, um, with um, from in fMRI um, field. Why in a PET is more used probably AL2 or AL3 or Hammers. In this case, we selected AL2. And uh, we use uh, three different types of standardization of time TV curves. Uh, in particular, one, this one, uh, the first one is uh, coming from uh, um, a paper published by Tomasi and the colleagues in, two, in 2017. The uh, other two was something that we, uh, you know, a modification of the first one. And uh, we uh, use uh, three different uh, approaches uh, to quantify the uh, metabolic connectivity. Four is, uh, are coming from a DICE approach, so four different types of uh, estimators. And uh, we developed in a uh, non-size method, so we use uh, three different types of similarity measures, in particular piston, co piston correlation, Euclidean distance, and cosine similarity. So, the results. Uh, here you see the AL2 results. So is uh, of course is uh, are too small to give a really a good look inside the networks uh, that we obtain. And in the green we have a uh, non-size methods. In um, in uh, you know considering these results, uh, we have uh, we were happy to see that we are able to reproduce a block diagonal structure. That is something that is expected to have. And uh, we have also um, happy to see some uh, left hemisphere, right hemisphere homotopic connections that are clearly distinguishable. So there's uh, two um, diagonal, um, sub-diagonal part of a, of a metric system. And so, uh, Good, so, but of course, if uh, we, we, we did some uh, quantification in order to understand which is the best, at least from a mathematical point of view. I'm not speaking about, of course, biological meaning of the results. So uh, we can compare uh, both here. In the first part, we have AEL2 results. In the, in the second part, the results coming from the Schaeffer atlas. We have a different standardization uh, method. We have a size and non-size methods. So in this case, uh, we, um, we uh, went, uh, we uh, decided to use the dice similarity between the previous uh, maps that uh, there was in the previous slides in order to understand the similarity between uh, what we obtain and of course, higher is the value, higher is the similarities between the maps. And uh, there is a clear distinction between uh, size and results where the similarity is very, very low, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and non-size uh, uh, metrics, uh, where similarity is, uh, is, I mean, it's not uh, the best, I mean, in any case, is uh, between 0 0.5 and 0 0.6. So non-size non methods, the methods just based on the similarity metrics, uh, have higher reproducibility for all standardizations, for the, the three different standardizations. If you give a look between the two different atlases, so if you compare this block with the first block is also, uh, you know, we can provide also the values, but in any case, uh, we have a different uh, between uh, um, differences between atlases. We have higher di dice values for AL2. And uh, we have also differences between the standardization uh, with um, higher dice for the standardization number two. So, the question, in any case, that we had is, uh, because here it is uh, from a mathematical point of view, just only a comparison of the maps, but uh, uh, 
there is any biological meaning on, on these maps. So we are happy because we have seen that the diagonal parts, fine, is something that is expected, but how to validate? We don't want to use this just only as additional biomarker. We want to use this to, uh, you know, to deal with structural connectivity, effective connectivity, functional connectivity, dynamic fun connectivity. So we have to understand if there is any really connectivity meaning inside this, the, the maps, or they are just only, you know, results, mathematical results, and that's all. So we decided to try to first to try to validate also the, the map. This is just the first step, the first way that we can, by a comparison of the maps with the structural connectivity results. And uh, again, uh, the atlas, uh, we use the atlas, uh, and we compare again uh, this, uh, uh, the si how similar is the stack of activity in comparison to our uh, maps. And again, uh, we have a bit uh, higher dice for non size method. And again, for AL2, we have a higher um, similarity. And so again, uh, the value are not is a note that is a 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.2 with 0. Point versus 0 0.2 with 0 0.3. So it's something that is telling us that there is some supporting, uh, some meaning, some uh, biological meaning of the maps that we obtain. But of course, it's not enough. We have to investigate deeper, deeper this, this issue. So how to validate, uh, of course, the structural connectivity so for the MRR studies. Uh, we can use the resting state from MRI, but again, uh, we, I don't think uh, we, that we would be really happy when we are able to reproduce exactly the same network uh, that we can reproduce with resting state from MRI. We can uh, add some values uh, by using PET. So we cannot really think to have a perfect match of them. But could be useful in any case to compare our results with resting state of MRI connectivity, effective or functional connectivity results. Uh, remember, we have a high density EEG result, and this could be really a good proxy to understand uh, uh, investigating and relating the connectivity coming from EEG with uh, a PET uh, if there is uh, some, uh, again, link to biology. Of course, uh, we have to remember we have a cognitive test is a really important issue and it's a really important ingredient so that we can use in order to validate the, the biological meaning of these maps. Of course, pathology, of course, uh, uh, we can deal with uh, MMG. We can use animal models. We are using also animal models in order to, to be sure to validate and listen the hubs. Is a hubs really or just only mathematical results? That's all. So I want to stress, we need, really need to validate. It's not possible to just to have a result and say, this is a connectivity. Connectivity in terms of structural, functional, effective connectivity. We are young in this environment. We don't have, we have a lot to think of the results. We have a lot of possibility to investigate it, to validate the results, but we must do this in order to say, before to say that is uh, a connectivity. So this is, uh, just to conclude my talk, uh, is uh, we were not really too happy with the uh, normalization that we performed because uh, uh, it's really closer to what is used in fMRI by using global senior regression. And I don't like global senior, senior regression of fMRI, I don't use it. Because we know, as uh, we know, it's important literature that uh, global scenario regression, in, part, in case of pathology, retains some information related to pathology. So we try to uh, uh, working with uh, our data set and trying to repeat uh, the previous uh, results. We also had uh, different ideas, and now we are not sure showing you the you know math part, but that's only the result the result part. So this is uh, is uh, of course after the classification is uh, something that is possible to derive by without any demeaning of a, of a time TV curse. So uh, again, we are, um, uh, we are um, able to speak about again, uh, segregation in inside the frontal network uh, and uh, its integration with the temporal and parietal part of a, of a network. Uh, 
and uh, uh, this is a work that is in preparation, uh, and, but also <coughs> we worked uh, in, uh, co by considering just only a piece of a time activity curse. So the first uh, portion of a time activity curse, uh, and this one, and the last portion of a time activity curse, uh, we apply exactly the same procedure, and we uh, add this, uh, this uh, two, again, uh, different uh, metabolic connectivity maps. One is more close to the K1, more is, well, the other one is more close to the K3, but also we uh, used uh, um, uh, secondary uh, results of a compartmental modeling, not keeping the K, uh, now the, con the concentration of the microparameters, but the possibility that the modeling give out uh, to split the two different uh, behavior of a tracer inside the, the brain tissue. So the green line that is referring to the behavior of um, the exchange between the blood inside the tissue and the um, blue line that is referring to the metabolic pathway of, um, of a pet of a pathway. So when we repeat exactly the same procedure, now not thinking, not just to consider the pieces of a time TV course, but the results uh, of a compartmental modeling, we more or less, uh, we have exactly the same results. So the first compartment, the second compartment, this one that is related to the force relation, is giving us uh, a, a map uh, really close to what we obtain by using the last part of a time TV curve and so on. Okay, this is just a, a spoiler of the uh, results that we are going to formalize. Okay, so again, I want to stress how to validate. This is the main focus uh, that I have in mind now. And uh, uh, again, uh, a gold standard method does not exist now. Uh, we have uh, several possibilities. We have a possibility to derive a lot of different type of maps, but a gold standard method does not exist. We have to investigate it more, better. We have to try to understand better which is the most effective method that we can have in order to have a single subject um, um, metabolic connectivity. So last slide is to, to give a thank you to the person in Padua working uh, um, at my department and Padua Neuroscience Center. In particular, a thank to um, Tommaso Volpi and Erika Silvestri that are, you know, the two persons that are focused on this type of stuff, uh, research. And a thank also to Professor Corbetta, that is the director of Padua Neuroscience Center. A thank you also to the doctors of Lasenko, Goyal, and Lee from Washington University uh, of St. Louis that provide us the, very, the data, but also support us with uh, wonderful discussions. So thank you for your time dedicated to my presentation. Thank you very much. We could take time for maybe one question. Okay, great talk, great, uh, really inspiring. Very quickly, so you showed in the second part of the presentation some results about the similarity of connectivity maps with different parameters. Uh, but the point is that you showed the similarity in terms of uh, the hubs, so the location of the hubs. Isn't it a bit, uh, you know, too complex way to compare things? Because when you co um, compute the hubness, I suppose you use participation coefficient, then you have to compute modules. So, I don't know, if we have to validate, shouldn't we state a much simpler level and just look at the similarity in correlation matrices? Did you do that too, I suppose? Yeah, this is, uh, was uh, just a first attempt uh, to, to understand uh, which is, uh, uh, is uh, of course, we can use DICE also in this case, uh, but we wanted to really to understand uh, the, 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 the network, so the composition of the network. So DICE similarity is, is saying you okay, is, uh, is similar or not similar. Uh, did you try to do that? I mean, you have results for this? What is more similar? For, for DICE is not here. Ah, not here, okay. It's not here. But we have uh, other the results regarding the, for instance, we are uh, going to apply gradients, uh, so we are doing uh, the comparison of about the modularity of these maps and something else. So we are going deeper, deeper in understanding the, the, this, yes. Uh, probably in the interest of time, let's move on. Let's thank Alessandro again. So we continue. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sharna Jamada, who is a senior research fellow at the Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. 
I might just bring this down, I'm a bit shorter. Okay, thanks everybody. So today I'll be presenting some work that we've been doing with uh, an approach that we call the functional PET approach. Uh, and we've applied it primarily in simultaneous PET MR. Um, so why would we want to look at simultaneous PET MR in the first place? So I think that everybody here knows that MRI and PET have both got complementary strengths and weaknesses. Um, don't have to tell people here that PET offers exquisite molecular imaging and it's quantitative, and we can measure many indices of neuronal activity. Um, by comparison, MRI offers exquisite structural imaging with high spatial resolution. And usually when we're talking about um, fMRI, we're talking about a blood oxygenation level dependent fMRI. So the bold response is used to infer neuronal activity indirectly from uh, changes in blood oxygenation. And it relies upon the concept of neurovascular coupling, which requires uh, this fairly complex cascade of events to occur before we're measuring our signal. And so because of this, um, fMRI is a non-quantitative measure that's unitless, and it means that we can't compare the bold response across brain regions, across subjects, uh, in the same subjects across time, or between scanners. And so in that respect, uh, PET is really um, exciting from the perspective of an fMRI like myself, because it does allow us to do those sorts of comparisons. And so I think that this is a um, really good uh, time to say that fMRI is not ground truth. <laughs> and so again, like I know that everybody here in this audience do, does know that, um, but I think that sometimes in the way that we um, approach our molecular connectivity uh, analyses, sometimes we might accidentally start using fMRI as ground truth. So we might have uh, two approaches to analyzing our molecular connectivity uh, data, and then we might find that one of them uh, compares better or more favorably with fMRI than the other. And then we might use that to, um, to say, well, that one's better than, than the one that doesn't compare as favorably. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're not trying to do a more expensive and a more invasive and a more difficult fMRI here. We're trying to discover something new about the brain. And so um, I do think that we should not uh, use fMRI as ground truth in that respect. Um, the other thing as well, okay, so let's move on to the next one. Okay, so um, in terms of the, uh, the FPET approach, the term FPET is, uh, is, is used to describe this approach that uses either a constant infusion or a bolus plus infusion technique. Um, and it's called FPET or functional PET to uh, draw comparisons with the fMRI approach. And so uh, the goal here is that by maintaining a constant plasma supply of FDG, dynamic changes in glucose metabolism in response to a stimulus or task can be measured. And so there was this landmark study published in 2014 that showed that, um, that this FPET approach does allow uh, measurement of dynamic changes in glucose uptake in response to a stimulus. And so in this proof of concept study, um, uh, the MGH group showed that they could uh, could uh, detect differences in, um, in alternating blocks of checkerboard stimuli um, and rest with a one minute uh, uh, frame duration. And so there's been a number of uh, approaches that have, uh, that have kind of taken with, with this and run to look at how we can use this to uh, examine um, something new about uh, glucose metabolism in the brain. So what's the highest temporal resolution that we can obtain? Um, so in that original paper, there was a frame duration of a minute. And uh, the Vienna group, uh, led by Rischke and, and Hahn et al, uh, had a look at seeing what was the optimal um, uh, task duration and frame duration that could be achieved using the FPET approach. And so by using a, um, a, a task-based approach, they determined that a, um, a task duration of five minutes with 30 second frame durations was optimal. In a small proof of concept study, we looked at whether or not we can uh, modify the administration method to get a better SNR or, or temporal resolution. And so here we uh, simply compared uh, just standard bolus infusion only or a 50%, oh, sorry. A 50% um, uh, bolus and 50% uh, infusion approach uh, to see if we could get a, a, a better SNR that would allow us to uh, to uh, reduce the the temporal resolution. 
And so on the basis of this, we, um, we determined that the bolus plus infusion approach does provide a more stable um, uh, uh, FPET uh, measure. However, um, the lowest that we were able to achieve was really a 16 second frame duration. We did try to um, push it down to four seconds, but we weren't convinced that we were detecting measurable signal. Um, in addition to that, uh, my collaborators at Monash Biomedical Imaging have also had a look at whether or not we can apply some uh, signal optimization methods, uh, such as Bausch priors um, and MR-informed uh, PET reconstruction to improve the temporal resolution, and we think on the basis of that we might be able to push it to around the 10-second range. Okay. So um, another point as well is that the definition of dynamic also varies across contexts. And so um, I wasn't quite sure how people would uh, receive me using this term static pet, but I've heard everybody saying it all, all day today, so it makes me feel very comfortable. Um, but when we're talking about static pet, it might also have been uh, acquired using a dynamic acquisition. So for example, if we want to measure the um, cerebral metabolic rate of glucose. Um, so static is not necessarily static, but however, if we've measured, um, if we've calculated that metabolic rate uh, across a scan period or across a frame duration that lasts of, uh, several minutes, then that analysis has assumed stationarity across the scan period. In addition, um, FPET does allow us to uh, study uh, within subject time courses, but the uh, uh, analyses that I'm going to show you today are also static in the, um, in the sense that they have also assumed stationarity across the, um, across the scan period. So while we're looking at time series of information, we're not do actually looking at uh, time varying connectivity like would be uh, occurring in sliding windows. Um, and so this contrasts with the language that we would use in fMRI, where a, di a truly dynamic connect home would be looking at those sliding windows, or we might be looking at um, dynamics using EG and so forth. And so um, I will just point out that there's this great paper by Lejoie and colleagues in 27 who discuss these concepts um, in, in respects to fMRI as well. Okay, so PET-MR measures of brain connectivity. Um, so the functional connectivity typically describes statistical de dependencies derived from neural time series. And so when we're talking or using the term functional connectivity, most of the time people are using that uh, interchangeably with an fMRI-based measure or hemodynamic connectivity. However, uh, functional connectivity can be measured with any functional neuroimaging approach, as everybody here knows. Um, so, and again, we know that, um, that this concept of functional connectivity predates uh, what we've seen in the fMRI literature by several decades. Um, and what's quite nice about these very early uh, uh, connect domes that we see um, by Barry Horvitz and colleagues in the 80s and 90s is that we can see some of this uh, structure that we're used to seeing in, um, in more modern neuroimaging where we see um, uh, more connect connections occurring across a diagonal, so regions that are close together are sharing common variants. However, um, as has previously uh, been mentioned by, um, by uh, uh, Aldana, uh, metabolic connectivity has been proposed as a putative uh, biomarker. However, um, I argue that in terms, for a, bio, for a measure to be a biomarker that will uh, give information about um, whether or not an individual person is likely to um, go on to develop an illness or to transition to an illness, that we need to have an individual level uh, measure. Sorry, okay. Sorry, I just disappeared here. Um, okay, so. What do I mean by this? Um, so in fMRI, what we would usually do is it would acquire a time series of, of images with some temporal resolution or repetition time. So in this example here, I, um, I've uh, acquired Im images every 2.45 seconds. We'll then apply a, um, a uh, parcellation and do a, a, a series of uh, correlation of time courses across ROIs for every individual and then create a group average of, of those individuals and, uh, and uh, visualise it in some way. So with a static PET, um, we see that we uh, obtain that single image per subject. We then can apply the same parcellation, but then what we're doing is an across-subject correlation. And so as mentioned previously, this is more of a covariance metric. 
Um, there are a number of complementary uh, or alternative approaches to being able to get to a individual uh, 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 level of um, measure of connectivity using static PET. Um, one, of, one approach is known as a metabolic connectivity mapping approach, which essentially uses the, um, uh, is based on the assumption that most of the FDG signal is occurring postsynaptically, and so it uses that information to essentially put an arrow on a functional connectome that's been estimated using fMRI. Uh, there's also an approach uh, known as metabolic similarity mapping, where essentially they have static PET and they look at the similarity in FDG uptake between regions um, and uh, use that to estimate a connectome at the individual level. So that's similar uh, to fMRI in that we have that individual level connectome, but it's different in that it's not measuring the time course of activity within individuals. When we're looking at a metabolic covariance map, what we're looking at is, uh, is uh, the consistency of, of FDG uptake across individuals. And so if you have a positive correlation, then what you can see is that you're having a consistent increase in FDG uptake in one region is also consistently happening in the other region across subjects. If you have a negative correlation, uh, uptake in one region is consistently going up and uptake in, in another region is consistently going down across subjects and a, um, a, a correlation close to zero is essentially showing that there's little consistency across individuals. With FPET, however, we can start to get an um, approach that is more similar to the fMRI approach. So here in this example, we've got a time series that's been acquired with a temporal resolution of 16 seconds. We've applied a parcellation. We've uh, correlated uh, the time course um, across regions for every single subject and then created a group average. And so in this comparison, what we were interested in was how the, um, the three uh, connectomes might compare to each other. So here we have the connectomes here. So um, you can see that they're vis visually very, very different, and uh, the FPET connectome was primarily dominated by frontoparietal connections both within and between networks. The, um, the SPET uh, covariance matrix was uh, predominated by uh, temporal subcortical covariance both within and between networks, and strong frontosubcortical, frontotemporal and parietal occipital connectivity. The fMRI connectome showed con strong connectivity within anatomical subdivisions, but then there were also uh, long-range uh, uh, connections between frontoparietal, parietal occipital, and temporoparietal regions. And so, uh, first off, I will just point out that just how um, different the signal properties are across the three here. You can see that the signal properties of the FPET approach is very small. Um, the maximum effect size that we're seeing here is around the 2.2 uh, um, um, area. And so that made it challenging to be able to, to compare these, these three connectomes. The other thing that I'll mention here is that um, at the outset, we, we kind of thought that the SPET covariance and the FPET connectivity matrices would probably be fairly similar. So we didn't really expect these um, very different patterns of, of connectivity um, uh, emerging bet between these three. Um, in the paper, we, we presented a residual analysis, but I quite like this early uh, analysis that we did, where we simply just looked at the correlation between the FPET and the fMRI, and the FPET and the SPET across regions. And so you can see first off that here in the, um, in the FPET and fMRI correlation, that there were a number of regions where the correlation was a, a, a non-zero. Whereas um, in the FPET and SPET correlation, even before comp uh, controlling for multiple comparisons, um, all of the regions virtually um, crossed zero. Um, and so uh, we interpreted this as suggesting that the FPET and the fMRI connectomes are telling us something um, uh, complementary but also unique about connectivity in the brain, but also that, um, that the SPET was, at least surprisingly to us, a poor predictor of the FPET connectivity. Um, okay, so this led us down to the um, path of exploring ergodicity, as has previously been discussed today. 
And so an ergodic process is one where a group level result is generalizable to individuals within the sample. And so um, I think that the example that we saw earlier today uh, from Christian is probably an example of um, Simpson pa Simpson's paradox, with his, which is an extreme version of, um, of non-ergodicity, where there's a sign reversal in the, um, in the correlation between the group level and the individual level. In practice, ergodic processes are quite rare, and they require that the process be, uh, that we um, meet two strict criteria. First off, that the process is homogenous across individuals within the sample, but also that the statistical per parameters of the process are constant over time. And uh, Simpson's paradox has actually been um, demonstrated previously in fMRI data uh, by Rhys Roberts and Donna Addis uh, Rose in 2016, uh, where they did show a small number of regions that showed, um, showed the, uh, the sign reversal at the individual level compared to the uh, group level. Uh, in a commentary to our, um, to our paper that I, I just uh, presented earlier, um, Ariana, Igor and colleagues um, uh, made a couple of really important points. And the first off is that ergodicity um, is not an all or none process, that it should be considered on a continuum, which we um, agree with. I think that that's, that's um, clear. Um, and then they also uh, noted that there were many factors that may have influenced ergodicity in our study. And so they mentioned things like pre-processing choices, uh, demographic differences between our, our subjects, uh, scanner resolution and so forth. Um, and in our reply to our in, in our reply to that commentary, um, again we agreed with that. However, we felt that that probably uh, is reflecting the fact that um, ergodicity is probably very very difficult to achieve with any neuroimaging measure, not just PET. Um, and so that uh, if we can get it within subject measure in order to develop a biomarker, that um, that it would be good to use one. Okay, so um, in our follow-up study that's just recently been published, we wanted to look a little bit more into how um, FPET connectivity might be related to cognition and whether or not, again, it can tell us something interesting about the brain that fMRI connectivity does not. And so we, in this uh, analysis, we were interested in whether or not um, cognition maps onto cognition, uh, sorry, cognition maps onto connectivity in a domain general or in a domain specific way. And so in this analysis, we used a, um, a partially squared latent uh, analysis. And we hypothesized that if cognition mapped on connectivity in a domain general way, that we'd obtain a single uh, cognition connectome relationship. Whereas if it mapped on, onto, cogni uh, sorry, onto uh, connectivity in a domain specific way, that we would get uh, multiple um, uh, cognition connectome uh, latent, latent variables that loaded separately on the different connect, uh, cognitive domains. Uh, basically, we found that there was a single uh, cognition connectivity pair that was obtained for each uh, method. Um, so the other, other cognition uh, connectivity pairs were uh, very, very non-significant. In both cases, it was a single pair. And so that um, offered uh, uh, support for this domain general um, uh, model of cognition connectivity mapping. In addition, however, you can see that there, was, uh, that there were differences in the cognition connectome relationships between the fMRI and the fPET. So first off, the, um, the fMRI loaded more strongly on memory, inhibitory control and depression, whereas the fPET relationship um, was really uh, quite strongly focused on executive function, which is probably non-surprising considering it tends to be predominated by fun uh, frontoparietal connections. And so on the basis of these results, we concluded that, um, that FPET and fMRI connectivity are telling us uh, complementary things, but also unique things about, um, about connectivity in the brain. Okay, so I just wanted to finish off by highlighting that um, uh, we've put a lot of work uh, the last couple of years into making our PET MR data available. So all the uh, the resting state data that I've presented today is publicly available on um, on Open Neuro. 
Um, and in addition, um, we've also made available some of our earlier data sets, which were some of our first attempts in this area, so they are a bit rough around the edges. However, um, what's nice about these is that they um, also, uh, we released list mode pet data, and so um, in this uh, 2021 scientific data paper, we demonstrated um, how you can uh, uh, basically reconstruct that using non-proprietary software so that you can start looking at pet MR connectivity yourselves. Um, we're starting to see the first papers come out from this work, which I'm super excited about. Um, so right at the end of last year, there was a paper from Guo and colleagues uh, published in MRM, where they looked at, um, at uh, functional connectivity and FDG uptake in the white matter. And they found that, um, that uh, fractional amplitudes of low frequency uh, ALF was um, in the white matter was related to, um, to FDG uptake. And so they concluded that um, we probably shouldn't be excluding white matter when we're looking at functional connectivity. Um, and in this uh, preprint that I recently found, um, they looked at that metabolic connectivity mapping approach and compared it to Granger causality. So you'll remember that metabolic connectivity approach, um, metabolic connectivity mapping approach, essentially um, is based on that assumption that the FDG signal is primarily postsynaptic, post and so that then it uses that information to uh, infer a direction onto fMRI-based uh, measures of connectivity. And what they found was that um, MCM versus Granger causality of our FPET uh, uh, data um, identified different patterns of effective connectivity. And so they, um, they concluded that uh, people should uh, be a little bit more um, uh, choosy in which effective connectivity approach that they choose to use using, um, <coughs> using PET. Yep, this is it. Um, so, in conclusion, I just wanted to thank all these lovely, all these lovely people, and uh, my funding sources. And I'd also like to acknowledge that all this work was conducted at Monash Biomedical Imaging on the lands of the Indigenous Kulin Nations, and I acknowledge their their um, elders, past, present, and emerging. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Sorry. Um, yeah, we have time for two questions. Hi. Thanks you. Hi. Thank you so much for the great talk. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, in the, one of the last slides that you presented, what do you think that FTG and bolt signal in the white matter mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I literally kind of looked into these um, as I was, um, it was a bit of a surprise to me to, to see these new papers being published by, with my work, so I kind of just got that little bit of a thrill seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. No, no, that's yeah. all right. You're being honest. <laughs> that, that I, uh, I knew. Yeah. I value that. Yeah. And have you ever considered doing a supra agency matrix um, just to see the connections between the FTG PET and the fMRI? Uh, so, graphs. Sorry, could you say that again? Like a supra agency matrix in which you put, um, you assess the connectivity between the FTG PET and the bold fMRI uh, matrices. Uh, no, we haven't done that. Okay. Um, I will say though that you mentioned sliding window approaches previously um, in one one of the other talks. Yeah, not, um, not related to that. Yeah, not yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just I'll just note that we did actually try to do some sliding window stuff very early on with our visual checkerboard data. Uh -huh. um, we didn't have any luck. Um, possibly it's with that uh, data we had a one minute temporal resolution. Um, so possibly um, you know with uh, using a bolus plus infusion and and some other signal optimization results. That sliding window stuff might start to be possible, but at least in our early attempts, it didn't work. So you mean that in total you had one minute of scanning? No, we had 60 minutes of scans, um, but minutes? we had one minute frame durations. Okay. And so we tried to do a sliding window approach similar to how yeah, you would yeah, do yeah. with the fMRI, um, and yeah, it just didn't work. How okay. long were the slide timing windows? Do you remember? Four frames. I can't remember. It was very early on. I think four okay, frames, okay. which would have been four seconds. And we did um, overlapping windows. Overlapping. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That's a great talk. Mm. Uh, based on your uh, FPED 
uh, analysis on the covariance matrix, uh, um, I, I, got, I got this kind of question is, how do you think, uh, how, how much of the signal that you are measuring as a function of connectivity is instead uh, biological similarity? Because when, when we do this dynamic approach, okay, it seems that the correlation are very small. Okay, and, and I would believe that that is like a closer definition of connectivity because we are looking at time dependent uh, oscillations. A and they are very small. So wh when we look at the static, we don't, have, uh, we don't have the time dimension. So we use people. And that might you know, reflect the fact that you have just two regions that they are organized in a similar way. And as a result of that, you know, they seem to covary. Have you, have you ever questioned so, the, you know, when you compare the covariance, the amount of variance that is between the static and the functional? Why is that? So I'm not sure if I understand. Are you, you, could you just repeat that? I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. What, what's, let's put it in the other way. Mm. What do you think are the differences, the biological differences, if there are any, that will explain uh, different presentation of covariance uh, or the variance you have from a static pet and a functional pet. Okay, um, so I guess that um, to that question I would, I would say that at the moment we don't really know, right? Um, but I think that um, by using this approach and we're currently trying to validate it a second uh, time using, uh, you know, different, different uh, uh, groups and um, and different uh, uh, radio tracer administration. Basically, we're, we're trying to just see if the effect holds a second time using different approaches. So I, I do take your point that, like, um, you know, the question is, what biological relevance does this even have? Um, I think that it's it's nice to be able to move to this uh, within subject approach where we are looking at things that are happening within an individual rather than across groups because I think that if this is ever going to be a, um, a biomarker that we need to kind of move to that but look you know a paper might be published tomorrow that basically says that hey we can't do this and you know like that's science right like um, you know we've We've presented what we have here. We're trying to replicate it in uh, using different approaches. Um, I guess you know maybe next year I'll come and say that it's got no relevance at all. Uh, but yeah, at the moment we think that it does. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Could I ask a quick question over yeah. here? Were you giving a task in the in these car in these? So in, in the data that I presented today, there, it was uh, purely resting state. Okay. Uh, so eyes open resting state. Uh, we have. Um, so earlier work that we did uh, was simple visual checkerboard stuff. Uh, we do have some data where we have used a, um, an anti-SACAD task. Um, most of the work using FPET has been very simple tasks, checkerboards, finger tapping and so forth. The Vienna group have used um, people playing Tetris. Um, one of the reasons why we use the anti-SACAD task is because it's so uh, well defined uh, uh, in um, preclinical models and so forth. Um, so yeah. In an ideal world, you might be able to extract different networks if you were creating correlations based on that activity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and we're actually we're trying to do that at the moment with that anti saccad data, but I don't have the results yet. Okay. Quick. Yeah, there is a question from um, Paul Vasca, who is connected remotely. So the time scales are quite different between PET and fMRI, so we wouldn't necessarily expect similar networks. Is there a biological basis for neural fluctuations on the PET time scale? Um, so I think that both the PET and the MRI are both too slow. Um, you know, when, if you compare it to the physiological process of interest, it's, it's, you know, it's very, very slow. And we need to be able to use um, EEG methods to be able to um, not just validate this stuff, but um, it's, it's a much more, I guess, um, a uh, closer effect um, in terms of being able to um, know the physiology but also the temporal resolution of it as well. So yes, it is slow. We are trying to um, get it to be faster. I don't know if we'll ever get it to be within that, that realm, but at the same time it's, it's, it's the case with fMRI as well. Let's thank Professor Gemma very much. Thank you. And the third presentation will be given by Professor Christina Herford, who will, because these things haven't been hard enough, she's going to do preclinical dynamic <laughs> pet connectivity. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, so thank you for the kind introduction and thanks for um, Igor and Ariana for inviting me. Um, indeed, um, doing um, simultaneous petaphomerae in rats already is difficult and then looking at um, dynamic functional connectivity is even more difficult. So um, these are very, the data I'm going to show you are still kind of preliminary and um, we are still have to validate them much more. But I thought it would be interesting for this community to show you what we have done um, in terms of dynamic connectivity. So um, as the previous speakers have already shown, this, the dynamic connectivity com comes actually from the fMRI field. And this is just like uh, to summarize this again. Um, when we have uh, two regions in the brain, or we, we define um, several regions in the brain using a brain atlas, and then we look um, how the board signal changes in fMRI, um, and we can use a sliding window approach to look at the change in connectivity. So as you see here, um, the dynamic connectivity shown here, we have a very good correlation, so it's very high. And then over time, it goes down. And then at the end, it's uh, very high between the regions again. So this is just two regions um, that we look at. But when we look um, at all pairwise combinations, we can see um, and derive these um, matrices. And we can also look at this, um, sorry. Huh? We can also look at this by, um, uh, looking at the, the, the lines between the, the regions and, and give them a measure of connectivity strengths. So um, the question we had now um, for, for looking at functional data is, can we analyze dynamic PET temporal fluctuations similar to what has been done in the fMRI field? And um, what you see here are not time activity curves. These are DVR uh, minus one values um, after a bolus plus constant infusion. And you see um, that at, at a certain time after the infusion, they come into an equilibrium state. And then we have the DVR minus one plotted over time. So now we wanted to explore this in more detail. So um, we wanted to compare it also to the fMRI data. So we used a seven Tesla Brucker scanner for um, deriving the board fMRI data. And then um, we did the PET using the PET insert. And this is um, very interesting for us because we can derive both um, the board um, data from, from the function of PET da uh, fMRI data and then also the um, PET data um, you, looking at neurotransmitter receptor interactions. Um, so what are the challenges? So first of all, the main challenge is um, the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution. So while we are talking about one to 10 minute time frames in PET, it's only seconds in fMRI. Um, we have a better um, sensitivity in PET though. Um, the acquisition time for usual PET scan is something about 60 to 90 minutes versus 10 to 15 minutes in fMRI. And also the signal distribution. So when we have a PET tracer like FDG, we have um, you know whole brain distribution. So that makes it a bit easier to really look at connectivities between regions. However, if we have a PET tracer that has the main uptake like raclopride like in the striatum, it's going to be very difficult because you know there's not much to correlate. Um, so in our study, we um, had a lot of PET scans from carbon-11 dust. So we thought, uh, let's take these data and have a, a closer look at this. So we have 30 animals, 30 rats that were scanned with carbon-11 dust. Then we, from the time activity curves, we derived the DVR-1 using the cerebellar gray matter um, as reference region. And then um, we can derive these static connectivity maps that you've seen um, already in the, previous um, in the previous presentations or also the dynamic connectivity maps that look more something like this. Um, at the same time, we derived um, the board fMRI data. We looked at the board signal changes over time. And also here, we can derive the dynamic functional connectivity. So, um, here, the first thing we looked at was um, how stable is the connectivity over time. So we did this first for the board fMRI data um, and um, for different regions. So these are mean values. And um, first we looked at 20 to 40 minutes, 40 to 60 and 60 to 80 minutes. And as you see, 
um, these matrices are very similar. So there are not so much changes over time. And then next we wanted to look at uh, the, the DASP data. Um, and here you see the DVR minus one again plotted over time. So we were interested to look at 30 to 40 minutes. So um, right after we get into an equilibrium state, then 51 to 60 minutes and 71 to 80 minutes. So these are um, static molecular connectivity matrices. And now to the dynamic data. Um, here we were first wanted to see what is the time, so we had one minute time frames and we wanted to see what gives us, um, how comparable is it when we increase uh, the number of frames that we include in our data analysis. So here we have 10 minute time frames, 20 minute time frames, 30 minute time frames, 40 minute time frames, and 50 minute time frames. And you see that basically the most uh, changes you see actually between the 10 minute and 20 minute time frames, while after 20, 30, there's not so much of a change anymore. So we think um, that going with the 20 minute time frames um, would be a good approach to start with. Um, so now we wanted to see um, when we use these 20 minute time frames and um, we look at the differences um, in our DVR minus one values. Um, so this is what we get from 21 to 40 minutes. 40 to 60 and 60 to 80 minutes. And as you can see in the early phase, um, due to the fact that um, the DVR minus one is not in an equilibrium, um, the connectivities are um, very high. So um, what could we do about this? So we thought we'd do like a data detrending um, approach and we actually could uh, reduce this connectivity that comes um, from, from the increase in, 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 in those regions. And we could actually decrease, um, when, when you compare here after detrending and before detrending, we could actually decrease um, the, the, the connectivity values. Um, now, um, this is a comparison that again compares the functional connectivity here in the upper row from the um, bold fMRI data at early time frames um, on the lower left and late time frames on the upper right. And you see the correlation between early and late time frames is um, very high, so 0.96. And it seems that the functional connectivity is very um, stable over time, so we don't see much changes in these animals over time. Um, also, in, in, for the molecular M, um, connectivity, um, the maps look quite different, as you see. But um, also here, from late, um, from early to late time frames, that there's, um, it seems to be very stable. Um, the correlation is not as high; it's 0.8. And then, when we compare both functional connectivity and molecular connectivity, as you can see. They look quite different. I mean, this is expected. We are looking at completely different markers. Um, one is uh, the serotonin transporter and the other one is um, the bold signal changes. So um, this is somehow expected. So then we um, went on and tested an independent component analysis um, in these reds. And um, we started doing this with the fMRI data. And um, we could actually reproduce what has been published in the literature and could um, identify several different networks that have been previously identified um, from other groups. And now we wanted to see, um, does that actually work when we do this for the PET data? So we started with two independent components. And what you can see is that we could derive, um, yeah, t two, um, component using one is um, more in the um, more forebrain or anterior part in the brain, and then the others are more in the in the um, posterior part in the brain. So also compromising here um, somehow the the alpha nuclei. So to make this maybe a bit more comparable to the fMRI, we thought uh, let's try also more components the 10 components, and then you see basically that you can, um, yeah, you, you get much more 
um, separation of these regions. And yeah, I mean, it, it's a little bit the question, how meaningful is this? And um, I think this is something one has to find out. Um, but it was, however, possible. And when you compare this to the um, data and fMRI, they are not really comparable, so they are quite different, which is also somehow expected. Yeah, so what's the biological meaning? I can also say that this is not really clear and I don't really have a good answer to that, but I would say when we look um, at the two component analysis, um, we can see that um, we have one um, um, yeah, high um, concentration here uh, where the dorsal um, rafa nuclei are and then um, we have the projection areas that, that are more in the midbrain and then go to the upper parts of the brain, which are the cortical regions, the striatum. So maybe this could be um, a separation to say, um, you know, these are the projection areas that we would expect. But um, when we go to more components, this is still questionable. Okay, um, now after we have done this and just um, normal rats at resting state without applying any task or challenges, we wanted to see what actually happens if we apply a pharmacological challenge. So what we used here in the study is a, a challenge with MDMA, which you also might know as ecstasy. It has a very high affinity to the serotonin transporter. Um, much higher than sir, uh, to, to the DAT or the norepinephrine transporter. So um, we thought, let's see um, what happens after when we apply this challenge during the PET acquisition, after we have reached an equilibrium state. And this is basically what you see here. Um, so again, you see the binding potential values over time plotted here. Um, we have um, a short time frame of from 30 to 40 sec uh, minutes that we can use um, as a baseline. And then you see the decrease of the DVR minus one. And here that you see the binding potential maps before at baseline and after the challenge. So these are just um, yeah, using um, the, the binding potentials as, as a validation. Um, and the same um, is here for the board fMRI data. So what you see here is the board signal change. Um, after applying the MDMA challenge, we see this decrease in the board signal. And I have to say, we actually also saw this in extracerebral regions. So this is um, not a decrease in, f in function, um, so in neuronal function, but this is probably um, also related to a vascular effect. Um, and when we compare um, the dust data directly with the fMRI data, we see that the decrease that we see um, for the um, molecular changes is much stronger than what we see in fMRI. So now we thought, okay, let's see um, what this looks like when we look at the connectivity data. And um, here you see um, the fMRI data um, first at baseline, um, the, the, on the lower left, and then after the MDMA challenge. And as you see, there's not so much of a change. There's only a slight decrease of about 10 to maybe 15% at the end. When we um, look at two, so we defined um, one as the 5-HT network. So these were regions with very high um, dust binding, and then the um, salience network um, compromising regions. Um, such as the cingulate cortex, the amygdala, um, and this is a network that's also very well known um, from the fMRI field. Um, so again, here, um, when we look at the hubs and connectivities, um, there was not so much of a change. And then when we look at the uh, molecular connectivity changes, this was actually um, higher. Um, so again, for the two networks, we see a decrease in connectivity, especially in regions with high um, dust binding. Um, and, and as you um, can see as well here. So it seems that when we look at molecular connectivity, we can pick up the changes much stronger than um, what we do in fMRI. 
And in summary, um, to summarize um, these data, um, molecular connectivity using DASP um, was evaluated and compared to fMRI connectivity here. Um, we got a stable readout and network properties, but yeah, so this is still, we have to take this, I guess, with a pinch of salt. So um, we need much more validation of the method. Um, we got um, physiologically meaningful independent components um, from the PET data. So at least when we use two component analysis, um, which we think could be the serotonergic projection areas. And um, we, we think that the molecular connectivity is more sensitive to MDMA um, compared to the hemodynamic connectivity. So with this, um, I would like to end my presentation and thank um, all the people involved in this work, especially Mario Arment and Tudor Ionesco, who did most of the data analysis, um, also to the group from Bharat Biswal and um, Tadashi Vatabe. Thank you very much. This presentation is open for questions. Well, well I start. Um, when you were doing your optimization of the timing, you recognize if you went too early, you weren't at equilibrium and you had to detrend it. When you're doing the, the MDMA displacements, what were you doing with that portion of the curve? Were you using that, that displacement or? I wasn't sure which time you were comparing to. Were you, um, you, you mean if we used the detrending bef before we applied? Did you also write? Did you yes, also take yes, we did. Yeah. So, okay. And, and is that was that detrending a little more complicated just because the the nature of the dynamic curve? If, if you're just doing a linear. No. No, not not that I remember. I mean, um, I, I I would have to look at this, but um, no. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Hey, Christina. Nice talk. I'm I'm wondering what is. What is the biological relevance? It's, isn't it just MDMA uh, competing with DASP for binding and making an occupancy plot yeah, so, in so a fancy way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this could be, I, I think we have to look into this much more. So, so that's also something I'm still critical about. Do we actually need um, this type of data analysis or is it good enough to look at binding, binding potential changes in different areas of the brain. And yeah, I mean, I, I guess this is something we need to really validate in much more detail. Um, and I don't have a good answer to that, to be honest. Could, could you use the occupancy of uh, MDMA to inform the fMRI network instead? So you, you will kind of have a causality on, yeah. on the fMRI? This is data. something we can try, yeah. Probably you told them, uh, just a curiosity, did you use anas anesthesia? Yes, we do. Um, we, we used 1.3% azoflurane, which okay. is more on the lower side. Um, I, I guess, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. We, we cannot uh, scan the animals awake in the scanner, for, especially yeah, not for such a long time. And we used azoflurane because I know it has an impact on the blood signal, but the thing is that um, Isoflurane also has um, it has been used a lot um, for dust pet imaging in small animals, and I think the reason also is that isoflurane is used so often is that due to the slight vasodilatory defect, the kinetics are much faster. So what I've seen is if we use other anesthetics such as alpha chloralose or meditumidine, the the kinetic gets very slow. So the time that we get into this equilibrium state would be maybe at 60 minutes or even later, and then we couldn't do a, yeah, this type of analysis. I, I'm curious about the stability of the effect of anesthesia in, uh, along all the experimental windows. So I don't know if there yeah, is I mean, any impact in you know looking the sliding windows or looking at the end of an experimental. Slide. I think the anesthesia, um, especially as a fluorine, we can control very well because we can we, we control for heart rate, um, breathing rate, and um, so so. I, I think with isoflurane that works much better than for other anesthesias. I, I would guess, I haven't tested this, that this would have much more of an effect at different time windows. Thank you. Have you thought about <coughs> doing some kind of lesion studies in the animal, maybe a hemispherectomy, where you're changing the network, 
and then to see to what extent is that going to be reflected in these data. I mean, that's, you've got rats. And, uh, so you mean, uh, let's say, a serotonergic lesion and see how this, yeah. A lot of different possibilities to, to truly physical, I mean, in a perfect world, I don't know if we can do optog optogenetics that way, which would be fabulous to be able to turn off our alter networks there, and can we demonstrate that yeah. with this, especially in a, in a pharmacologically specific manner? Yeah, so we have thought about optogenetics, we haven't thought about uh, the, the lesion model, but yeah. The lesion's more both, complicated, both you have to do some work. controls and all that, but the optogenetics yeah. would, would be very cool. Yeah. Other questions? No more? All right, let's thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Professor Yakushev is going to give us some uh, closing thoughts, I believe. And, and closing thoughts and next steps. So I, I tried to, uh, to summarize. Um, well, uh, relevant conclusions uh, just on one slides, on, on two slides. Um, well, it looks like connectivity analysis of group pet data, whether it's glucose consumption, dopamine transport density, or synaptic density, reveal non-random patterns or spatial relationships between brain regions. These patterns partly overlap with the patterns of structural and functional connectivity. Interpretation might it be that it is a healthy population based or healthy shared portion of the brain connectome. FDG covariance is at least as reproducible as fMRI functional connectivity. Multi tracer studies should and uh, multimodal studies should contribute to the validation and, in general, to the characterization of the brain connectome or brain architecture. Special patterns vary with methods of image quantification, absolute versus relative, as example, image processing and connectivity modeling. And functional PET is very promising, but approaches to increase single to noise ratio are warranted. And um, now I would like to uh, present a preliminary action plan of the working group, which will be uh, discussed in detail in the next weeks. So um, publications, it's <laughs> another order. Position paper on molecular connectivity is submitted. So it is done. Um, as um, Ariana mentioned, uh, we have a um, few databases it was a big piece of work to summarize all studies, to summarize accessible pet data sets, and to summarize tools that can be used to model uh, molecular connectivity. And we think that this um, data should be uh, published to, uh, to be available for, for the community, to um, encourage community to analyze pet data, also in the context of, um, of um, brain connectivity. So priority studies, um, there are studies that, let's say, are more important. In our eyes, um, one of them would be simulation. Uh, I think it's important to better understand um, behavior of, of uh, these correlations, so if we would modulate regional intensity. It doesn't matter which, which tracer, which modality. Regional intensity and, and, and um, see how correlations, how these connections um, uh, change. We need more um, uh, mock or simulation data. So impact of image processing should be better understood. Nature of negative correlations. Data heterogeneity. This um, uh, especially concerns uh, multi-center data. Resources for the community. So, website of the molecular connectivity working group is done. Thank you, Ariana. Um, databases. So, they represent the current state, but of course, they need support. They need update and they need to be made um, functional, so searchable for the community. Uh, and it is also a lot of work. Uh, update support of the website. 
communication. Yes, uh, the next meeting we, we plan as nomenclature meeting. You have noticed that there are uh, many discussions about, uh, about the terminology, static, functional, dynamic, uh, and um, uh, yes, uh, it's um, uh, unclear. And also, there is a mixture between between um, fMRI or MRI-based uh, connectivity measurements and PET and the co context. So um, uh, we think it is important to to define the terminology uh, more clearly. So this would require grant application. And uh, this would require a simple organization of the meeting. So, and we planned this meeting at the beginning of 2023 in Munich. Uh, Ariana complains that um, my presentation have too uh, few images. So I uh, showed a nice image of Munich. And um, in the next days, we will uh, send all attendees um, feedback forms and we really ask you to provide your feedback, to provide your suggestions. And there is also an indication uh, or you may also indicate your interest in participating in this initiative in the next days. And um, well, we gratefully acknowledge support of the International Society for Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism, <coughs> International Brain, Research Organization, Ixico, PMOD, Organization for Human Brain Mapping and Human Brain Project. And thank you all for, for the great discussion. Um, I enjoyed it. I hope you also. And yeah, see you next time. And uh, Ariana will say some final words. Does this work? Yeah. I would just like to thank all of you again for participating. Actually, I didn't thought we would have gotten so many people because, I mean, it's such a weird topic, right? But apparently the interest is increasing. And I think my name came up a lot, but I mean, Igor has suffered through all the steps of organization, really. So we shared the pain equally. So <laughs> thanks to you as well. <laughs> And thanks to all the speakers who came all the way here. Uh, and some of them also, thanks for putting in touch with the sponsors actually that are giving uh, you access to this event and us for, for free, which is not to be taken for granted. And so, yeah, thanks all of you. And again, if you want to participate to the initiative, you will be given a chance to do so. And we will be around during the main conference in the next day. So if you want to reach out, discuss whatever you'd like, feel free to stalk us as much as you want. So thank you very much. Thank you.